Welcome to Grux Online. I'm Emma Vario, the director of the event. Thank you for joining us on this second Grux Online event, bigger and better than our first event last year. We can't wait to share these great talks and sessions. This conference is a celebration of game UX and all that it entails. There will be talks on UX design, user research, accessibility, and approachability and diversity. This event is hosted by the IGDA's GRUXIG. The acronym comes from Games Research and User Experience Special Interest Group, and it focuses on user experience in games. I'd like to thank all the volunteers that made this event possible. This would not have happened without them. The event team comprises of myself, Seb, Louise, Lauren, and Raphael, and of course, our wonderful speakers and everyone who submitted a talk are praiseworthy as well. This event is free and accessible. There are captions as well as ASL interpretation for all of the talks. We chose ASL as most of our viewers are in North America, but we do hope that the interpretation benefits people based elsewhere as well. All of that is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Player Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch. The content is divided roughly into two tracks, one for UX design and a second one for user research. Regardless of your title and background, we hope you'll find something interesting on both tracks. The videos will also be available later on our YouTube channel. The tracks are shown three times in a span of 24 hours so everyone in the world can choose the best time to view this today. Of course, there will be YouTube chat for live discussion, but we also have a Discord server for a more permanent asynchronous discussion across all time zones. A channel for each talk will be there for a few weeks, so you can join the discussion with people on other time zones that are watching it at a different time, or if you're watching the talks later, you can join the discussion then as well. The server itself hosts a wonderful community, so you might want to look at other channels there as well if you're interested in game UX design or games user research, accessibility, or any of the other topics you hear about today. We want this to be a safe space for everyone, regardless of background, experience, or other characteristics. So feel free to reach out to our moderators if you see or experience anything that makes you uncomfortable. Now, enjoy Grux Online. I'm looking forward to seeing you among the discussions on YouTube and in the Discord.
our community of games user experience professionals with our Discord and Twitter. And subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content, including Rocks Online attendee offers from sponsors Sketch and Balsamic. Check out the link below. Hi everyone, my name is Steve. I'm a user researcher working in games. Today I'm really excited to talk to you about the topic of how to get games user research experience without already having a job in the industry. So I've been working as a games user researcher for around a decade now. I started with PlayStation's European team where I joined as a junior researcher and stayed there for around five years. During that time I was exposed to a huge number of really interesting projects both from hardware, for example, working on a PlayStation VR headset, working with big teams such as on Horizon, and with smaller teams. PlayStation funds a number of indie teams to create a single game, and it was really exciting to work with those small teams and see the impact that user research can have even on small games. Since then, I've continued to work in the games industry, both running playtests, and also help teams integrate playtesting into their design and development process. I started and ran the Games User Research Mentoring Programme for five years, uh, which partnered students and people who are interested in joining the industry with people who were already established, people who had uh, worked at big companies or were working at big companies and could provide guidance and help people join the industry. This is a topic I've always been very interested in and I was lucky enough last year to be able to wrap up all of my experience both mentoring talking to mentors and people who were interested in joining the industry and talking to industry leaders to, into a book, uh, How to Be a Games User Researcher, which explains what do you need to do to start a career in games user research and the skills you need to have and how to get those skills. One thing I heard in all of these conversations is how hard it is to get that first job in games. There are a few reasons for this. First of all, there are not many junior roles out there, and when there are those roles, there's a lot of competition for them. A lot of people are finishing PhDs or finishing postgraduate courses. People are very interested in games, and so it's an area that gets a lot of attention. Both those factors combined to mean that it's very hard for a new candidate to stand out. And that's why experience is really important. It's a key differentiator that helps you stand out from everyone else applying for the job. However, there's that classic catch-22 situation. It's very hard to get the job without having experience, but how do you get experience without having a job in the first place? This is a very common question that we get when we're doing mentoring or I'm speaking to people entering the industry, and it's a real problem that we want to solve. One solution that I've talked about in the book, I've talked about in mentoring, and uh, what I'm going to present today is me doing it myself, is to look to usability reviews. I'll explain in a second what a usability review is, but it's a way of practicing some of those research skills for real and helps gain some of that experience that you can then use for CVs or job applications. 
First of all, a bit of background in case the term usability review is new to you. Sometimes they are called expert reviews or heuristic reviews. The idea of a usability review is that one or more researchers play through the game and we look out for usability issues, places where the player doesn't understand where they're meant to go uh, or might not understand what they're meant to do, places that don't follow many of the best practices around how to make games understandable and usable. As we know as researchers, this type of study isn't suitable for many objectives. We're not the same as our players, and so although we can spot potential usability issues, there's other questions we won't be able to give reliable answers to. Things like, what will players think about this game? Is my game fun? What's the best bit? What's the worst bit? Is really a test question that you do need real users to answer, but a usability review can focus on some of the uh, more obvious usability issues that might turn up in a real test. This method is sometimes used in industry, often it's less convincing than an actual usability test where you can show a video of a participant having problems or show some real data from players. And so because it's not very convincing, it's not the most common uh, method used in industry. It is sometimes so used for job applications, so it's a good skill to practice for applying for jobs. And also the case study that we're gonna look at today uh, also allows you to practice many other research skills that are very commonly part of the research process. What we're going to talk about today is how to run a usability review on a real game that is during development. We'll talk about how to find the game, what to do when you get the game, how to debrief that and how to work with the team, and how to change that into a portfolio piece that you can share with a recruiter, you can put on a blog or a website, and again, helps you stand out from all the other people applying for these games user research jobs. The first step of that, and one of the first challenges that sometimes people run into when they're trying to organize this kind of thing, is where do we find the right kind of games? Obviously you could take a game that's already been released and you can look at that, but that has some downsides. Because the game is finished, there's no chance that your review is actually gonna have any impact on the game. And also because you don't have access to the team who are working on it, you can't ask the type of questions that help you identify what's the right objectives and what should I be testing and looking at in this game review. One of the places I've found that is particularly helpful for finding in development games are playtesting forums. So there are forums across the internet where game developers are looking for playtest feedback on their game. A couple of examples. Uh, Reddit has its r slash playtesters forum. It also has its r slash playmygame forum. Itch.io has its own forum for giving feedback. I think it's called Get Feedback. And lots of games maintain their own Discord as well for community building and also to help create a space where they can get feedback on their game from fans during development. Now, because a lot of the industry is not familiar with user research or usability reviews, these developers don't know that they're looking for uh, usability feedback. They are often just asking for playtest feedback. They want someone to play the game and say if they liked it or if they didn't like it. We can do better than that because we are professionals and we're learning about user research. We can go to them and we can explain, actually, I know you're just after, after general feedback, but I can do something more than that. I can I use my best practice and my skills to identify usability issues, usability issues that will stop people understanding or being able to play your game as you expect. There is the opportunity here to explain to them what we can do and to convince them that a usability review is both useful to what they're doing and will give them valuable feedback to help improve their game. So there are a couple of criteria to keep in mind when you're looking on these playtest forums and you can see posts for hundreds of different games that are looking for feedback, what is the right game for you to review? Some criteria I found helpful to think about is first of all, do they have time to fix their issues? Are they at an appropriate stage in development where it's they're still working on it, still interested in feedback? Hopefully most of the things on these forums will be able to fix issues. If they were too late to take on board feedback, they probably wouldn't be asking for feedback. So luckily a lot of the ones on the forum are suitable for this. Second point is, can the team handle usability feedback? Are they looking for other type of feedback like uh, difficulty balancing or other things where 
it's too late for them to hear feedback about fundamental parts of the game, that's something that you can work out both by looking at their original post to look at the type of feedback that they're looking for and also by following up with them to ask questions about what are they currently thinking about on the game, what are the problems they have and work out is it a useful time for them for them to get usability feedback about the game. A third criteria to think about is can I run this review? Is it a genre I'm familiar with? Is it a genre I know enough about that I will be able to look at the game, understand how it's meant to work, understand the design intent, what is it the designer is trying to do, and propose something useful uh, by understanding the game well. And the last point, and this is a discussion you have to have with that developer, is can I share what I learned? Obviously, one of the reasons we're trying to do this is to create case studies that you can talk about and share on the internet. Usually this isn't a problem for indie developers. Any sort of press or people talking about their game counts as marketing and creates interest in their game. So that's less of an issue than it is for big studios. But it is worth checking with the developer that they understand that you want to talk publicly about the work that you do on this game. So last year, I decided I wanted to do this myself. Rather than just advising it as a mentoring activity for other people to do, that would be unfair if I hadn't gone through the experience myself and seen what it's like, what are the challenges, so that I can help people through this journey. And I spotted this post. It was for a, a first person puzzle game, something like Portal or the Talos Principle, and uh, they were asking for feedback on their game. Uh, beta testers specifically. So I looked at this post and I saw, do they have time to take on feedback? Probably yes, because they're asking for feedback. Do they want usability feedback? I was unsure about that, so I wanted to get in touch and ask, is it useful to get this kind of user research and user feedback, usability feedback from me? Is it a genre I understand? Yes, this is a genre I've played many other games in this uh, genre. I think I would understand how the game is meant to work enough that I could have a sensible discussion around it. And can I talk about what I do in this study? And for that one, again, I needed to ask the developer a question to see, is it okay with them? To do that, I had to make an approach. I had to get in contact with them and ask them these questions so I understood more about what would be useful to them and then I could work out, can I help them? And is this a suitable case study? The first thing to keep in mind when you are approaching people is that they don't know they want user research. As we've talked about, many of these teams have not experienced user research or user researchers before. And so they have a poor understanding of the differences between informal play testing or beta testing or just getting feedback about the game, as we've talked about, versus formal user research. So us running a usability study, identifying some usability issues and giving them feedback in a structured way. That's the thing you have to explain. And so you have to say, hi, I run usability reviews. I can help you with your game. I was wondering if you're interested in usability review. If you do sign up for it though, I'm going to ask to talk about it in public and use it as a case study. Luckily in this case, the developer was very happy both for me to do the review and also share it in this lesson that we're covering today. And there's a bit of back and forth in that. So you have to have a chat with them to work out what parts of the game are in scope or out of scope. And also when is feedback useful? If it took you six months to run the review, it's probably too late for them because they'll already have released by then. But when is are the deadlines that they have hanging over them? When are they open to feedback? When is it too late to tell them problems with their game? Once you've had that conversation, they're probably sent to you a build of the game so you've got ready to test and you know what it is that is useful feedback to them and what's too late to give feedback about. It's time to run the actual usability itself. I think running usability review is a big topic. We could obviously do this whole 25 minutes on just running usability review. And because of that, I'm not going to try. Instead, I know there's plenty of great talks already on YouTube about how to run good usability reviews. For a start, take a look at this talk from Seb where he has done a meta review of lots of usability reviews that he has seen from students and given feedback on how to do a high quality usability review. 
But here's how I did it. So I started with a blank mind map. I like using mind maps and note taking, and I spoke at a previous uh, conference, the Games User Research Summer Camp, about why I like mind maps and also how to use a mind map for, for note taking. I started with it entirely blank because at that point I knew nothing about the game. What I tried to do on my first playthrough was try and get as close to that real player experience as possible. So I played through the game just as a normal player would. Any problems or bits where I was unclear, I wrote them down. For example, in this picture, it tells me about, in the game, about density and mass, and I wasn't sure what density or mass was doing in the game. So I wrote, well, it's not immediately explained, but maybe it's explained later, because at that point I didn't know what would happen next. And I didn't know what that experience would be later on. I did this for as much of the game as we'd agreed to play. I think it was the first three hours I was looking at, although you could probably work with your developer to work out what is the appropriate amount of time to run this kind of review for. And just to give some context, here is a little bit of the game being played. As you can see, it's a puzzle game, very similar to Portal, and it's a physics-based puzzle game. So you're given a number of tools that you can change some objects mass and density and later on their size and you have to use that to solve puzzles within the game. Having played through the game once I then did it again. This time I wanted to play it more as a researcher so taking it a lot slower not going for that real player experience but looking out for things where either I had got confused earlier on and now with the context of having played through I understood why I got confused and if it ever got better but also looking, testing every mechanic and trying everything so that I can identify all of the issues in the game. So some examples of the type of notes I took on this playthrough is I noticed the tooltips don't stay on screen and that's obviously not great. Uh, it's how they're teaching the controls, but it doesn't, they disappear after a certain amount of time. It doesn't want you to demonstrate you've learned it before they get rid of them. And so on this play, I was noting all the occurrences where this happened which is really useful later on in the report, so I can say, here's all the occurrences of this issue. And then I had one last playthrough. I understood a range of the usability issues. I'd done some work to try and describe why those issues occurred and what made them happen, but some of those issues needed more explanation or exploration so that I understood exactly why they occurred and could describe it in a rigorous and interesting way for our teams. I've talked many times before about the cause impact format for describing usability issues. The causes, what is it about the game that made this problem occur? And so I play through the game, for example, again, for that control tutorials issue, and I'll describe all of the causes that I'd seen and probe exactly how the game works so that I could describe all of the causes. Then, with the impacts, I'm aiming to describe what will that do to the player. Uh, in this case, the players might miss the tutorial or they won't have learnt how to play the game or how to use that mechanic, and that can cause difficulty progressing. So on this last playthrough, I'm making sure I understand all of the issues in depth and can articulate them properly. And as always, you want to prioritise the issues. You might come out of your review having identified 30, 40 issues and that's overwhelming for a small indie dev team to to deal with particularly ones who haven't had any history of working with user research before because of that you want to identify what are the most important issues that they should focus on and help point them towards the biggest problems i always recommend this uh, chart which is by user focus as a quick way of thinking about how to prioritize usability issues it asks a number of questions such as does this occur on a red route? Is it a thing that the player has to do to progress? Is it difficult to overcome? Is it the sort of thing where someone might need to step in or they might need to Google it to find out how to overcome it? Or will they figure it out by themselves? And also, is the problem persistent? Once you've encountered that issue once, do you know how to overcome it in the future? Or is it an issue that every time you hit that same point, you're gonna have that same issue and there's no work around each time? By thinking about all of those factors and asking yes or no questions, you can rate the severity of your issues that you've identified and then pick out the most critical or the most interesting ones to uh, prioritise when you're talking about the problems with your game team.
And then on to sharing it. So at this point, you have gone through the game, you've identified a lot of the usability issues inside the game, you've picked which are the most important ones, and you've described what are the causes of those issues and also the impact. What does that cause to happen to players? One way of sharing that with a game team is by making a report. That's often a very traditional way that people who work with user researchers expect. It's not always the best way. When you're working closely with teams, there are other ways of sharing findings than writing a report. But while we're doing practice and as a case study, it's a good idea to use this as an opportunity to practice making a user research report. I've got a link to the full report of this game at the end of this uh, video. And so feel free to download it, have a look at the section to look at the issues and how I've described them. And you'll see how we go through what are the objectives, what are usability issues, and what are our recommendations for what the team should do next. Again, really helpful, actionable feedback that the game developer can take on. Because we're doing this as a learning opportunity, this is a great time to get some feedback as well. For example, you should show it to a peer or a researcher who can uh, look at your issues, look how you've described them and give any feedback on whether you've articulated them correctly. I'm always happy to give that kind of feedback, so do get in touch if that's helpful. And I know a lot of the games research community will as well. If you're on the, the Grux Discord, I think there are channels there where people can give feedback and, and I know the community is always happy to do this. You want to share your report with the development team. If you are able to present it live, again, that's fantastic practice because that's a lot more like what the job is really like when you're working with real teams and you're employed to do this. Actually having the opportunity to present it to the team is good experience that you can talk about in interviews. But if not, sending it to them by email, the report, and then asking for feedback by email is a fine second. And what you should do a couple of weeks later is follow up with them, see what did they do with the report, what changes have they made. This again is really helpful evidence of the impact that your research has had so that you can talk about that when you're interviewing or on your portfolio. Which brings us to our last point, making it into a portfolio piece. So a report is great and great practice of actually being a user researcher and the type of thing you would be doing for the job. It's experience you can draw upon when you're interviewing, but a report isn't the same as it actually being a portfolio piece. So what you should do is consider the format that report we've made and the reports that you'll see at the end of this presentation is a PDF, which isn't great for a portfolio. It doesn't tell the story of what you did, it just shows the results. And so to share it with others, you want to tell that story, not just show the report. You want to give some context about what did you do? You contacted the developer, you identified some objectives, what did they want to learn from the study? You applied a research method and you've decided why this is an appropriate research method. You can explain why that's the appropriate research method. You can talk about how you perform the review what you some of the issues that you learnt, and also how you communicated those issues with the game dev team and what they did in response how did it change their ideas how did it change their the game that they're making what was the impact of your study and you can tell that story as a blog post i think it's a great uh, format to tell that story of i ran this review here's what i found and also include some of those issues that you found either by including the full report or some screenshots of parts of the report. And another benefit of this being a project on a real game is sometimes you get a credit. Uh, you get public recognition of, hey, uh, what I did made a difference to this game and people who play the game will see that you've had that impact forevermore. And there you have it, a portfolio piece by running a usability review of an in-development game that has a real impact on the game design decisions and the actual outcome of the final game, which is great experience that you can use for job interviews. All that remains is to actually see the usability review so that you can see what one of these looks like for real. I have put a link to the full report on the website, uh, the link here gamesuserresearch.com slash grux. From there, you can find the full reports. Also some links to other resources if you're interested in doing more of this kind of thing, both a link to my book about how to become a games user researcher 
and also a link to my free monthly lessons on game user research skills like we've talked about today. I would love to hear your experience when you do this yourself and creating your own reviews. And as I mentioned, I'm really happy to give feedback on you doing your own reviews. Do get in touch either by email, ux at stevebromley.com or by Twitter at Steve underscore Bromley. And I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much for your time listening today and good luck with your usability reviews in the future. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.
I want to talk to you today about how you can make your research org more strategic by calling out eight things you can start doing now to position you and your team in a way that drives more impact and has your colleagues and collaborators coming back for more. Earlier in my career, I had the opportunity to build a games user research program from the ground up. The first thing I did was implement tools and processes that allowed us to do lots of evaluative research. Things like playtesting, um, lots of usability studies, and every game was like a scientific specimen to be prodded, picked apart, and studied deeply. I knew there was more to user research than getting caught up in these evaluative cycles that, at times, only delivered incremental improvements. Evaluative research is certainly important, but as I like to say, it's only one tentacle of the octopus. A strategic research organization helps design and development teams see all of the possibilities. I knew there was more that we could be doing. We would run playtests after playtests, wishing that we could have been involved earlier. As our team grew, we were able to stop wishing and start doing some real design strategy work. Okay, so what's design strategy? According to the internet, design strategy is the intersection between business profitability and value for people. It helps businesses figure out the question of what to do next. So if that is the case, research can help us not only figure out how to build something right, such as the towers we see here, but it can also help us figure out what to build in the first place. Do we even need a tower? Maybe we need a bridge instead. Without being strategic, you get stuck in the how to build it right rut. Should it be tall, wide? Should it have a flag on top? Maybe it should. We assume people like flags. But figuring out what to build in the first place, this is the sweet spot for user research. Understanding user needs and influencing what product gets made in the first place absolves so much chance for error and failure later on. And while a strategic research team might be influencing a game's concept from its earliest stages of development, strategy can impact so many different levels. Insights captures can, can influence features inside of a game, marketing campaigns, or even UX initiatives such as overhauling a game's onboarding experience. Okay, so I know what you are thinking. If evaluative research is a tentacle and we're talking about eight other things, well, that, ups, that adds up to like nine things. So for now, let's make evaluative research the head, or I guess that would be called the beak. And, uh, and yes, I realize that this is actually a giant squid. But anyways, evalu evaluative research is pretty foundational. It was, it was at least for me and you know, building the practice and getting a user research program off the ground. But let's walk through the eight other items. And, and as we do, I'll give you some ideas as to why these items are important and how you can start implementing them in your research practice. Tentacle number one, prioritize discovery. If there's only one thing you do out of all of these eight items, do this one. Why? Well, first of all, discovery research is strategy. Innovation requires going beyond surface level insights. So what's discovery research? Probably you've heard terms like problem space. You've maybe done work like player profiling. Perhaps you've built things like personas. You've done or heard about things like co-creation or cultural probes, experience mapping. In a nutshell, it is the kind of research you do to find things like latent needs and problems that need solving. Now, games are different than things used for utility. So I see discovery research in the world of games as a way to understand how to capture new audiences and influence meaning and mechanics inside of a game by learning about people's lived experiences. Innovation really requires about going to the core. It's about getting to people's inner reasoning, inner thinking, philosophies, emotional reactions, motivations. And doing this kind of work really gets to say like why people might play a game in the first place. It helps us understand the philosophies, 
behind why people might play socially or not. So how do you start prioritizing doing that kind of discovery work, that, that amazing design thinking, design strategy kind of work? First of all, when you have a choice, do a discovery project. When you don't, add discovery to your project. So when you have a choice, run the discovery-oriented project. For example, you might have a couple of research projects that you discuss with your game or product partner, and both have equal weight for priority for some reason or another, such as, you know, your product partner or your game partner says, I know we need to start evaluating the first time player experience to make it better and retain more players, but I also know we are curious about innovating on some social features and we'd like to take a blue sky approach. Kick off the discovery work. The first time user experience work can wait. Sometimes you don't have a choice. You'll talk and talk to your product manager, or, you know, your game, your game designer, and you find out that the, the evaluative work might take priority. So this is when you can start bringing discovery oriented questions into your evaluative projects. You can call this doing the discovery sandwich. Now, a discovery sandwich means that, you know, discovery is the bread, evaluating is the meat and the lettuce and the tomatoes, and then you have some discovery at the end. So let's say your team is working on a new avatar creation experience and user research wasn't involved until after something was built or after something was built. And I can, I can tell you, this is something that happened oftentimes to me. We get involved in a project a little late, but there were still all these discovery and generative oriented questions about like, you know, what, what's appealing to people and, and, and how perhaps to make the avatar experience more inclusive. You can make the case to include dis discovery oriented questions in your interview guide. For example, what went through your mind the last time you created an avatar? Then, you go through the, the script where they actually use the tool that your team has built to make the avatar. And then at the end, you ask things like, how might what you use today address some of the thoughts you brought up before? All right, tentacle number two, start a listening practice. So a listening practice is a way to get deep insights from players on a rolling basis. So it's actually another way to add discovery and prioritize discovery to your work. So by, by default, it is innately strategic. It's also a way to have a steady flow of insights come in uh, for those really needy artifacts that you dream of building, things like personas or journey maps. But a lot of those kinds of artifacts, they require, they require capturing a lot of deep insights, like doing a lot of user interview work, and that can be re really, um, time time consuming. So a listening practice is a way to add more discovery work to your research and it allows for making time to get that steady flow of insights. So how do you do it? Kick off something called a player listening program. You'll need to work with your dev teams to figure out which players to listen to. You know, if they're current players or players of competitor games, ideally it would be a mixture of both. It's so important to get out of our heads and learn from players of other games or even people who don't yet play games. So what you do is you decide, okay, how often are we going to do player listening? Is it quarterly? Is it monthly? Is it sprintly? You don't need a script. So this makes it easy to do. You simply schedule the sessions and you say to the player that you're talking to, you know, what goes through your mind when you play the game that you want to have them talk about? or maybe a genre of games that you have you want to have them talk about. Listen to what they say and use your innate user research curiosity to get beyond surface level insights. Okay, temple, tentacle number three, test stimuli, not solutions. So eventually you'll get deep into, you know, right before a game is about to launch and sure, you're gonna be testing builds and like versions and things like that, that's normal. But strategy, strategy is time. We can start learning before we build anything. And it's so important for us to start detaching ourselves from our solutions. We start treating our games, our ideas as our babies. And when we do that, 
we limit our, the opportunity to learn and learn about possibilities that might be better. Testing stimuli is simple. You just test other people's stuff, such as art. There are so many interesting ways to get visual and audio stimuli, stimuli from the web. There are libraries with public domain images, such as the ones I'm using in this presentation. And there's tools like Canva that you can use to make mood boards and storyboards. And the other thing you can do as the researcher is you can make the stimuli. Don't wait for your dev teams to make stimuli for you. Take a load off their backs and put some items together that align with your research questions. In this case, perhaps you're trying to understand affinities to female and male dress throughout the ages in order to influence rarity of content in your character creator. All right, tentacle number four, start running workshops. Why? Because workshops are fun. Yeah, I said it, the F word, fun. Honestly, if you work in games and you aren't having fun, you're doing something wrong. Being creative with our colleagues is so invigorating and as a research leader, we should be getting creative with how the teams we support are taking action on taking action on the insights. Okay, so what do I mean by taking action on taking action on the insights? Don't wait around for the game jam. Don't get sad when you aren't invited to the game jam. Run your own game jam, where jamming happens as influenced by the insights you've captured or your team has captured. Start incorporating things like affinity mapping. And I'll be transparent. I was, it wasn't really until I left games and worked in some other industries and then came back and did some freelance work that I realized the value of doing collaborative workshops. For example, genres that stimulate or reference real life or real life hobbies really benefit from de digging deep into those real life hobbies to say like interviews, discovery interviews. You can then work collaboratively and remotely using a tool like Mural or Miro to find themes and patterns. Work with your game designers to decide what kinds of game design lenses you would like to consider as you are doing the mapping. Here I'm showing you some obvious examples that might have been extracted for, say, a farming game. If we had talked to people who love farming or, you know, some light uh, gardening, like growing vegetables. Tentacle number five, design your alignment process, like treat your alignment process as a product of itself. Because strategy is approach. If you run a research project using the wrong method, for example, if you ask about usability in the survey, you should have been observing it in the first place, right? You are going to let yourself and everyone else down. More importantly, we have to be asking the right questions in the first place. So I recommend two areas to add some design flair to, those being the creation of strong questions and Drawing from our previous workshop related tentacle, start running alignment workshops. So strong questions tend to have key parts. They should start with a verb. They have some sort of directionality or spatial thing happening. So I'm calling it a vector space. And they help us understand the drivers, you know, who is being driven. And they also help us understand why the question needs to get answered in the first place, like the value to the business, right? So you can make a grab bag of words and verbs and spaces and drivers and who's and what's and why's to help you create really strong questions for your research products. Might someone want to take this, on, this one on? Discover the totality of experiences when making an avatar so that we can be more inclusive. I think that'd be a great PhD project, perhaps. If you think there are parts missing here, just add them. All you need is more prepositions. This is a beautiful image I found on the internet, and I believe the tool used to create this image was Miro, a tool I have no affiliation with, but have enjoyed using in the past. There's also Mural, I believe Figma now has FigJam. So these are all collaborative whiteboards and they're awesome. And they are tools that I did not use in the past. Um, if you know about my work history, Apologies to, to my entire team that I ever worked with. I, I wish we had had this tool. So typically I would create a slide deck to drive alignment meetings, but a workshop could be more fun and a collaborative way of kicking off user research. It also just helps people think and make sure more voices are heard rather than the user researcher just speaking the whole time during like reading out the deck. 
this kind of puts the, the agency in your stakeholders' hands, right? One downside to collaborative whiteboards is that they are not super accessible to people who use screen readers, so keep that in mind. What I've done here is just I've taken some of the questions um, and the screenshot uh, the, and this user research kickoff canvas, and I've just, you can see here, I've taken some examples of how to make those questions a little more game oriented. You know, if you see the word user, switch it to the word player. Uh, you know, games are a lot about emotions. You know, uh, apps that are utilitarian are a lot about problems to be solved. But for us, we're trying, you know, we're trying to help our game developers create experiences that evoke certain feelings. So those are some things to keep in mind when you find these kinds of uh, product canvases to just to, to shift and rejig the kinds of questions that you're asking. Tentacle number six, schedule weekly insights broadcasts. Okay, so remember back to tentacle, tentacle number two. So I mentioned to start a regular cadence of player listening, but you know, you don't want those insights to just go and die on Confluence or SharePoint or on your hard drive. Consider getting a weekly share out on the calendar. Yes, I said weekly. I can't take credit for this one at all. A recent manager of mine suggested doing this. It was groundbreaking. By getting a dedicated time on the calendar, you save so much time of having to like schedule and work out people's times. You just get it on the calendar. You let everyone know this is the time it's gonna be happening. Move some stuff around. You, you find the time obviously that works the best for everyone. And I promise you'll be able to. So this weekly meeting will be incredibly influential. It will just be strategic by de definition. This is a great way to build trust with the people you're supporting. You will help your developers and game designers um, and UX partners keep the player in mind at a regular cadence. So how do you do it? All you have to do is get it on the schedule. Let's say you have a giant report. You can read out part one, you know, one week and the other part next week without the guesswork of when, you know, part one and part two is happening. This can also be a great time to run a short workshop with the, the insights presented, say like the week. So if you presented insights the week before, let everyone know that next week we're actually gonna get together and do a little more work to really ingest those insights and start using them to be creative and innovative on the game. So looking at the schedule we see here, it seems like I think a fine time present to present might be on Friday after Dr. G.V. McGill presents on the, play, uh, the place of philosophy on modern society. Tentacle number seven, recommend what to do and what not to do. Stop waiting for your product managers to tell you what needs to get researched and make some recommendations. Better yet, make some recommendations for what not to do as well. If I had a nickel for every time I ran a usability study that could have just been an A-B test, I'd probably have like 35 cents. I will be honest, saying no to work is a bit of an art form. But in this case, I'm not completely telling you to say no. No one wants to work with someone, you know, who's super difficult and just turning research down. That's, that's not what I'm advocating for. Rather, I'd recommend just like making, rec I'd recommend saying, hey, like might we approach this question in a different way? You know, A-B testing is a great example. So there may be situation where, maybe situations where you can use a more scalable method, such as simply running an A-B test inside of your game. And certainly this isn't news. Companies have been doing A-B testing for years. The issue that I ran into is that A-B test ownership wasn't really within our user research service. So we had to do some work to leverage the tools available to us and also build relationships with the people who were running the A-B test so that when there was a gray area for like, should this be just a usability study, like an, an unmoderated usability study or just an A-B test that we can run in game, we had some, some people we could work with, we could bring in our co counterparts and we could leverage those tools. Another thing you can start doing is to just listen for assumptions. So you likely won't need this fancy assumption finding radar system because honestly, they tend to just fly around in the air all the time. I've heard things like, we know what the player wants because we are the player. Women will like our cooperative mode. Or here's a list of features already validated by our head of technology as meeting user needs. 
When you hear an assumption, one thing you can say is, what's your thinking on that assumption? Finding assumptions can be a great way to kick off research that could impact success. Because while sunsets are beautiful in nature, they are not beautiful in games. Games fail and get sunsetted for many different reasons, but our responsibility as researchers is to at least call out assumptions when we hear them so that we are not designing with falsehoods in mind. All right, almost there. Tentacle number eight, build learning plans for your research roadmaps. So, Learning plans are great for helping you find overlapping needs across your organization, right? Being efficiency, being efficient, spending a little less money, combining projects so, so that you're killing two birds with one stone. It also helps us prioritize the most impactful work. So let's say you're supporting two different games. One is about drinking milk, as you see on the left here, and one is about, looks like it's about ducks. So if you were like me in the past, you would just bucket milk into one milk bucket, and then you'd bucket ducks into the duck bucket, right? And you just build the roadmaps for each game. You make a separate plan, and perhaps your roadmap would look something like this, a list of projects and vendors or tools, and the quarter at which it's getting made and the cost, but when we do this, we might miss the fact that the audience of milk drinking game really overlaps with the audience of duck jumping game. So to prevent this, start a practice called building a learning plan. I took this one from Leah Buley's um, user experience team of one. I love this template. And so you can do this with each of your teams. But the goal is that you might uncover similar questions. So as you're talking to teams and sort of using this template to understand what you need to uncover, what beliefs your teams have, um, the KPIs are trying to drive. You can then start to realize that maybe there's some overlap. Maybe there's some research you've done in the past. Um, and you can start building your research plans by initiative rather than by game. You can start doing projects that are much more impactful and you can help your team start to see all the possibilities. So what were the tentacles again? So if we said evaluative research, it's kind of the foundation of our research practice. The other eight tentacles are prioritize discovery, start a listening practice, test stimuli, design your alignment process, run workshops, schedule weekly insights broadcasts, recommend what to do and what not to do, and build learning plans for research roadmaps. And I get it, eight is a lot, but you can put on your thinking cap, like our friend right here, and get creative. There's no prescriptive right or wrong, or wrong way to do each of these items, and they don't have to be done all at once. As you take on projects, consider which of these items you could initiate through that project. As researchers, we all want to be impactful. With these items, I hope you can help the teams you support see all the po possibilities, or as I like to say, all the tentacles of the octopus. Thank you. I'd ha be happy to answer your questions, and you can find me on the IGDA Grox Discord. I love talking about user research. Crux Online is sponsored by Balsamic. Balsamic Wireframes is the industry standard for rapid, low-fidelity wireframing. It combines the comfort and simplicity of paper sketching with the power of a digital tool so your work is easier to share, modify, and get honest feedback on. Crux Online is sponsored by Player Research. Player Research is the premier games user research partner, enabling game dev to gain meaningful insight from real players across the world. Delivering actionable insights on usability, UX, appeal, and play so that you can focus on the game.
Playtest Cloud is your destination for modern and effortless mobile usability and playtesting. Over 300 studios test their games with our panel of over 1 million players. These players help you discover why players play, how they play.
and our community of games user experience professionals with our Discord and Twitter. And subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content, including Grox Online attendee offers from sponsors Sketch and Balsamic. Check out the link below. Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. My name is João Paulo Nogueira and I'm going to present to you the Domino's Persona 2021, how we remote research Latin America through the COVID-19 pandemic. This is our table of content. So I'm going to present the context, problems, personas, our methodology, interviews, analysis, validation and results. So about us, uh, this research was conducted by me and Viviane Mesquita. She is the lead product designer at Gazelles and I'm the senior product designer in the Domino's game. And about the company, uh, this picture was taken before the pandemic. Uh, Gazelles has over 70 collaborators and over 25 classic casual games in the portfolio. It's a Brazilian company established in Rio de Janeiro but we have Canadian, Canadian studios too, and we have been remotely working since March 20. Uh, and our mission is building fun through simplicity. Uh, about Domino's, uh, Domino's is, is based on the classic board game where you have to match the tiles with co corresponding pins, amount of pins, and it's again played by two or four players. Uh, in our Domino, Domino's game, we offer four different game modes and uh, we have uh, 1.3 million monthly active users and our business model is free with a VIP subscription for benefits. Before we started this research, we had uh, some data from different sources inside the company. So we knew our audience by marketing personas, by past surveys from the business intelligence team and some uh, remote playtests using the playtest cloud service. And about the COVID-19 Brazil, uh, the social, social isolation started on March 20 and the vaccination started only on January of this year. Uh, we had uh, a lot of problems with COVID here in Brazil. Uh, I have some numbers in this slide, but uh, the main pact was that we had to create a methodology to recruit and interview players remotely while our own team was remotely working. Uh, for instance, I'm, I'm living in Manaus in the north of Brazil and the rest of the team was in Rio de Janeiro. So we, we were far apart. So inside, uh, moving to a problem. Our problem was that uh, we had some data about players but we, the development team needed to understand behaviors and motivations to make better decisions for, for the next features. Uh, but we, we, the world was in a pandemic. We were limited to invite players to see play tests, to, to have, uh, to receive people at our, our company. And then uh, a starting point for everything was our Matriz SD. Uh, I couldn't find any reference in English, but it's uh, certainties, assumptions and questions matrix. So we listed everything that the team know about the, knew about the game and the, the, the target, the audience and the market. Uh, uh, we listed our hypothesis, well, things that, we m that maybe we knew 
and uh, also the question things that we want to know wanted to know so after this uh, our main questions were who were our UX design personas uh, how could we remotely interview players and validate data within our player base and how could we increase the revenue based on our UX design personas the main goal, of course, was the, the UX persona we, we had to design then, but the secondary goal was to understand players' behaviors and motivations when playing dominoes, deepen the understanding of data collection from analytics, and design a research methodology that we could share with the other teams inside the company. Uh, right at the starting point for the research uh, in the immersion stage, uh, we also used some other personas report from other companies, such as Tapjoy, New Zoo, Quantic Foundry for motivations. Uh, and also we collected some data inside Gazelles and uh, game designers were using the Bortles player types. So uh, about basic, uh, basic knowledge about personas. Uh, when talking about personas, it's important to to say that it's a fictional profile, but it's someone that the team can look at this profile and make decisions based on realistic data, on on something that we, we it, it's a real behavior or motivation from the players. So most of the time that you see personas being used, they will fail. I uh, have a list of some reasons. So the first one is shallow profile. It's it doesn't have the, the depth needed for the decision making. Uh, it wasn't based on user data. Uh, it was created but not used by the team. So it stayed on the wall. Everyone could see it, but they uh, didn't take it, it into consideration. Uh, they are used, but they have no updates. So personas need to be updated from time to time. From time, to time. So in this case, they are not updated, so you, you make decisions on a snapshot of a profile in the past. No buy-in from leadership. This is the case of UX maturity in the company. Uh, the persona was not co-created, so it's important to, to gather material from everywhere and from the players, discuss with the team. Uh, there were lack of instructions, so they were created. The team has all the material, but they don't know how to use personas to, to make decisions or to discuss. And the last one is there are types of personas. So as I said, we had marketing personas, but the answers provided by these profiles, they were not the same that we were seeking uh, with a UX persona. So when creating uh, our personas, we, we considered information. Uh, we need to provide useful data and insights for decision making for all the team. Uh, segmentation, we need to, to find between these profiles that we are researching uh, niches or new opportunities and try to, to make recruiting easier up from this. And representation, uh, updates are created according to the market changes and research reports. People change. So next year, what may may happen that these these behaviors may change? Uh, for the past years, we had the pandemic, for example. Then, uh, our although after our immersion, the starting point was creating proto personas. Proto personas are lightweight form of ad hoc personas created with no new research. Basically, uh, you have a, a the team to discuss uh, the most common profiles that are used in the game or based on information that we already have. And these proto personas, uh, we need to validate them later. So for our port proto personas, we created them from a mind map. Uh, we started from the same point, the will to play dominoes. Then we split according to the experience goal. Uh, a relaxing activity or a competitive activity, so chill or thrill. 
then we went down one level and split it again uh, based on secondary goals according to what we already knew about them so people wanted just to practice dominoes or they wanted to to have challenging matches and these goals were in the next layer and in the end we selected four endpoints based on different gameplay motivations so challenge strategy competition and the uh, community um, then we, we had these four proto personas and all of them had name image demographics journey uh, experience goals motivators and behaviors it's important to say that the pictures that we used for these personas, they were generated by an AI-based uh, website that I'm explaining here. So uh, we, in this way, uh, they are free, so we, we avoid using real people pictures in the, in the research. Uh, about our methodology. We use design thinking in our daily basis uh, on all researchers and, and uh, features that we are developing the games. So this personal research, it was uh, focused on the first part, the understanding. So empathizing with the players and defining what we were going to do. And when analyzing everything that we already had, uh, we detected that we needed to reinforce the information with interviews and surveys. Since we had already data from uh, remote playtesting, demographics, metrics, analytics, and store reviews, for example. Um, in this slide, I present to you every UX tool that, or framework that we used during all the research. So we had uh, the marketing personas, demographics, metrics, analytics, the CAQ matrix, uh, empathy maps, proto personas, surveys, interviews, player journeys, player segmentations, play tests, how my wish and lessons learned. learned. So this is the, the, the graph that explain our research. We had sta six stages for it. And then we have these big moments where we uh, advance from one step, relevant step to the other one. So, uh, as I said, we had a data Im immersion in the planning and recruitment stage. Then we would assess Brazilian players for these, uh, for, to identify these behaviors and uh, motivations. Then we would analyze this data and check with the player base, validate with the player base if uh, this is this is the same for, for everyone or not, you know, which behaviors or motivations would uh, be different. And then we would validate them and create our personas 2021. This was our schedule for the, the research. We started earlier in February and we finished in the, the beginning of May. Uh, it's important to, to say that uh, the researchers had to split time between the project and other activities so we work with agile the, the sprints were, were going on so we had to solve uh, these tasks and also research uh, which means that we could have shortened this time if we were full-time dedicated to the research the next step is, uh, is about the interviews for them we started with a recruitment survey uh, we created a survey to, in Google Forms for this interview. We used this survey to collect quantitative data while recruiting these Brazilian players. And uh, they received this survey via the survey link via push notification sent by our community team. Uh, some recruitment numbers. Uh, the push notification was sent to over 1 million players. From all these, these uh, a little more than 5,000 opened the push notification and we had uh, 608 ones answered surveys. So we we checked our uh, goal for number of, of uh, surveys. And going on, we had the opt-in for the interviews, we had a recruitment, we had interviews scheduled, and in the end we had the players that were really interviewed for uh, qualitative data. So we had a goal to, uh, we had numbers to, to make the quantitative study and the qualitative study. Based on the, the answers from the survey, 
uh, we created this recruitment uh, service answer the spreadsheet where we use the parameters and values to funnel the profiles that we uh, would you use to validate the proto personas? So we created four main filters for this, uh, and these parameters were saved in the in, uh, in Google Sheets. So whenever we needed to select more players for recruitment, uh, we would pick these filters or broad them. So uh, it's important to say here that we selected uh, the, the profiles that had more in common with the. the Proto personas, so we could see if we can validate the data or not. In the end, we had to, to broad the, the selection filters because uh, it's hard to recruit, as you saw. Uh, contacting players, uh, Agazil's representative contacted selected players by phone call and presented the company, the research, the way we collected the person's contact because they asked, oh, how, how you got my, my phone number? And we had to remind them and uh, then we asked if we could schedule an interview so these three people Carolina Araújo, Rodrigo Caldas, Paulo Sabino they helped a lot and we would like to publicly say thank to them about the whatsapp schedule uh, we asked in the survey which messenger uh, people uh, would like to, to talk to us that we would use or, or they their preference. WhatsApp is very common in Brazil, very popular. So it was the, the highest choice for everyone. Uh, then we scripted our message according to the replies and outputs and uh, in order to facilitate this communication. So uh, for instance, we if they had a specific question, it's kind of uh, FAQ. So we would do, use that uh, answer copy and paste in the WhatsApp. For the interview script, we created this Google Docs file where we had big uh, question groups based on profile, game experience, monetization, tournaments, and social aspects of the game. And we created 65 total questions, uh, a lot of them. Uh, but when testing the interviews internally, we noticed that we could reduce them to 24 after uh, uh, refinement. So yeah, it, it was way shorter than the, the first one. But in the end, this script for the interview, it was used more as a reminder than a guide for us. So in the, the heat of the, the interview, we'd let people talk and we would check this script and say, ah, okay, we forgot to to ask about monetization and then we start the, some questions or conversation about it. Also before each interview we had a short meeting with team members uh, and we would uh, discuss w which were the hot topics for that specific profile. So we would see the recruitment survey answers so for instance uh, which game mode they, they play most or what is their position about uh, people abandoning the game, leaving the game. And uh, then based on this, we would, ah, okay, we need to explore further this information. And then we add that to our briefing uh, template. For the interviews, uh, 30 to five minutes before the interview, we contacted them again as a reminder. Uh, and in the schedule time, we called them via a WhatsApp video call, unless they stated that they wanted a regular WhatsApp audio call. So, uh, and also we explained that we were going to record everything, uh, but uh, it, half of the people more or less uh, used the WhatsApp video call and the other half used the uh, audio call. Uh, each interview had an average time of 30 minutes. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in the, our setup, we recorded the audio using a notebook running a, out, an audio recording program, a microphone, and a smartphone on a stand and a connected to a charger to avoid uh, running out of battery. So this setup was most basically the one I'm using to, to record this session, but I had the phone here and would talk to the person in the, the, in the call while watching the, the, while reading the script and talk to people on Discord. Uh, 
team members, as I said, team members were connected to this Discord channel, uh, Mirror Room, in which the audio from the call was shared. So if they needed me to ask in depth information about a, a behavior or motivation, I would read on the Discord and then ask in the interview. Uh, after the, each interview, uh, yeah, during during the interview, they would take notes and suggest more exploration, some topics, as I said. But after the interview, we would gather in the in the Discord channel and discuss all relevant information and impressions and details about what they said. Sometimes players shared about rules and di that differs from our game. So we would prepare a br the briefing document based on all this information. Uh, rewards are, are important, an important part of research like this, so we couldn't offer a monetary reward for players, but we offered VIP codes that they would use to, to gain one month of sub VIP subscription. Uh, this is a huge improvement point for our research that will evolve, can and will evolve with the company UX Maturity, uh, because there was a situation where we interviewed VIP players that couldn't we use this VIP code because they were already VIP players. Now I'm going to talk a, a little about analysis. Uh, after collecting all the, the briefing documents from all interviews, uh, we prepared the, these validation points the proto-personas, experience goals, motivators and behaviors. We review all audios and the briefing notes collected player codes from this content, uh, extracted all the player needs that they verbally uh, expressed to us, collected the, all the declared behaviors when playing the game or preparing to play or, they, or from their journey. Uh, we prepared insights based on this data, uh, segmented the, the users and created the personas. So uh, uh, this is the starting point for us to segment our, our users. Our users, we had uh, two axes. Uh, the first one, the horizontal, is related to uh, gameplay experience goal. So they want to a more casual session, place to chill, or a competitive session, place to thrill, as I, I explained earlier. And the vertical axis is related to the opponent behavior. So uh, they would uh, would like to play against uh, someone who is has an instant gameplay, and this is uh, related to our bots because they instantly play the game, and uh, some players like and others don't like. So this is our vertical axis: artificial behavior and natural behavior. So more human. Uh, the player waits for some seconds before playing the tile, and that's it. Then uh, we would position all the, the interviewed profiles in these axes related to the both axes. We, we create uh, values for each one and position in accord to these values. And as you can see, we had uh, each color was trying to validate our proto persona. Uh, they were spread uh, in, the, in the graph, so we had to watch where they would cluster. And we have two main clusters, one in the middle of the, the graphic and another one a little to the right in the competitive session. And kind of split between the both behaviors, and an artificial and natural. Based on these clusters, we found these two personas. Uh, Team Costa is the first one, reflects our casual players with no preferred opponent, and Battle Battaglia reflects our skilled and competitive players who prefer humans, but also play bots. Our spontaneous persona, the Team Costa, as you can see, we created the journey based on all reports and how they would be the, the, the daily routine of the person. Uh, we added the player needs, things that they play for it, we had the desires, what they expect or dreams about the game, the frustrations, what's blocking, what blocks the, the, these needs, and the quotes that we call. Some quotes, because this, this was just a card, but we had other in the documentation. 
And also in the bottom left of the, the card, you can see the segmentation where it's positioned. Then we have the Battle Battaglia, and you, the same information, just uh, with uh, data rel uh, related to this persona. Also, we estimated player routines based on what players told us for each persona. So, for instance, Spontaneous had a lot of smaller sessions during the day with a, a bigger session after the being at home with family and had, had, had something to eat with everyone. And before going to bed, they had this bigger session. The competitive player persona uh, had fewer sessions during the day and the most significant play session was at night after dinner and the uh, family activity. So they would f uh, really go to the game and play their, their the matches they wanted. We know that we have future exploration in this this graphic, uh, especially about the, the profiles that may be related to exclusive playing against bots, another one that exclusively play against people, and an, um, a more casual one that just want to relax while you're playing. But we, yeah, this is the for the next step next year. Then we had the validation. Uh, this is the, the step of where we worked on that. This is the moment that we collect, got all the data from Brazilian players and now we wanted to see if the same behavior and motivations would uh, be valid for the other players in, in other countries in Latin America. So how would we do that? We selected by the, the language the game was being played. So we had three main languages, English, Portuguese from Brazil, and Spanish. The, the validation service structure was, uh, we had closed and the answer about these hot topics, motivations, bots, players abandoning the game, and monetization social. And we had also uh, open-ended answer question in, in, in the, the survey. Then we created our insights and then the takeaways. Uh, again, about the data collection, we recruited them via uh, an in-game opt-in according to the device language. We, inside the game, we invited them to, okay, can, we, can you answer a survey that will help us to make a better, a better game for you? Uh, we, uh, the answers were, were collected in a Google Form survey, and we, th this survey was running and open for uh, the second week, third week in, in May. Uh, we got 2,876 answers in, in Spanish, um, 1,735 answers in Brazilian Portuguese, and 1,005 answers in English. So uh, this ratio uh, is interesting because it matches how the game is distributed in Latin America. Uh, the v so about the v this validation, uh, from all the data that we collected during this research, we can say this, uh, people want flowing matches with quick turns against or with the same people, the same players from the beginning to end without interruptions, be them advertisement or technical issues, and while being able to express themselves without affecting the game flow. And we had more specific points. So uh, the close-ended answers helped us to differ cultural profiles inside our personas. So even though we had uh, Beto Battaglia and Chin Costa, uh, we know that, for instance, uh, we can, in the future, uh, use a, a competitive profile that is more towards not using the shot because people who play in English, they, they don't like the shot very much. So that's it. Uh, we were able to validate insights from the persona research and topics related to player times, communication, robots, advertisement, and scout the interest for f future features. Uh, we saw that players are vocal in different ways, and the open-ended answers collect uh, the answers collected corroborate information from our from other sources such as our community report, our past surveys, our playtests, and other interviews. So uh, whenever 
they have um, they they have the possibility to say something about the game. They are they, they are vocal about that. Uh, and in the end, we detected that we were at a saturation point when considering inputs from different methods. So we felt that okay, this is the point that we should end the uh, the persona research this year and go back to it next year. The closed-ended answers analysis, we, we compared the answers from all three languages. We compared with data from other sources inside the company, like uh, BI data. Uh, the team discussion about profiles and cultural differences or the reasoning behind uh, the difference in the graphics. Uh, we documented these main differences between these profiles and shared information with other teams. For example, uh, the data that we collected in these questions, we shared with market team. So they were able to create specific campaigns to, uh, for instance, the people that were, that were playing the game in Spanish. So a hot topic for them was uh, explored for mark, for, uh, in, ma in the market campaign. Also in the open-ended analysis, this is how we, we did it. We read and categorized all answers by their content. We prioritized uh, suggestions and critics due to their potential improvements to the game. We create subcategories for these suggestions and critics. So we could create filters for uh, a better analysis. Then we created a single sentence for each topic covering the general idea we prioritized according to the number of related comments. Uh, from there, we had a, a team discussion session about the, the results. We related all the findings with game design documents or project uh, tasks. So they, they are directly connected to actions in the, in the project. And uh, in the end, we also had a, an analysis documentation with how might we use to, to help game design and project managers uh, with the uh, action points. Then what did we learn from it? Uh, that overall, Dominus is a praised game. People like it and uh, like to say that uh, it's special for them. It's uh, what they do in their relaxed time. So they, they have strong opinions about some points of the game, but they praise it. Uh, Players have comments and suggestions about specific details, such as game rules, UI flows, emojis, and moderations. Uh, we learned that technical issues uh, were regarding crashes and freezes and interaction bugs, and problems with statistics, for instance, not registering some victories. victories. Uh, they, they can be analyzed deeply by the development team uh, from this data that we collected. Ads are a big frustration point for our players. Um, I think that's very common in all free-to-play uh, products. But ads are, are really a frustration point. And, but we had a, a, a subscription benefit that is removing ads. Uh, but we, we needed to, to deeply analyze and discuss how we can promote and improve our VIP subscription based on this, because it seems that player didn't match the, the, two, the two points that are uh, subscription will remove ads and they are suffering from, from this, these same ads in the gameplay session. So results. Uh, our main deliverables were the personas, Team Costa and Beto Battaglia. Uh, we were, were able to detect the difference based on language um, through Latin America. Uh, people playing the game in Spanish in Brazilian Portuguese and English. Uh, we created the insights and how might we and had a table relating these findings and action points for the team. And also we created these lesson learned 12 lessons that we shared with other teams. <coughs> for insights, we use the formula. It's a, we get a, a player need, we add a, a barrier or difficulty for it and then we add a, a player quote. So this is the, the insight that we used and we created how might we based on, on this insight. So we 
could have uh, discussion points. And in the last part, the team evaluated uh, which Domino's key results were affected by solving that problem. And then we assigned the Jira task or game design page document in Confluence to it. So for example, a uh, player need would be uh, a complete match without players leaving the game. The barrier is uh, players leave matches and are replaced by bots. And the player quote was, uh, when someone leaves the game and is replaced by a bot, I leave the game too. How might we make quitting less impactful for the players who are left in the match? And the, uh, solving this would affect our retention and uh, our, we, we are trying to motivate players to stay online. And uh, the action point was registering on a uh, game design document or a Jira task. Okay. Uh, so we, we were able to have difference based on languages. Uh, players in all languages, they consider the domains a relaxed activity. They prefer to play bots or people depending on the context they are in at the moment. They like playing other people because they are unpredictable. Uh, they say playing with other people is challenging for this reason. Uh, they think quitters should be punished. Um, it's a disruptive behavior. Uh, they like to see the number of features and they don't care about subscription. Because they don't, uh, they don't, they can't say which are the benefits, like removing ads. And the difference is based on language. I have them on this slide, but the most important part is that knowing this difference was very relevant for our, for instance, our market team too, because they could, as I gave the example, uh, orient the campaigns to each of, of, of uh, this audience. <coughs> um, what, I, what else I can say about this slide is that uh, Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese players, they have a behavior similar to this, the Spanish ones, the Spanish speaker ones, uh, such as they are friendly in shot, uh, they, winning is important, but competition, the result is as well. Uh, it's a pastime and the, they, they are more similar. The English speakers, uh, winning also is a goal, but they are very competitive. Uh, Dominus is considered a serious hobby not only a pastime, and uh, they don't want to use the chat. And uh, yeah, and then now we have the lessons learned. <clears throat> For this document, we took notes during all the personal research. So every time that we had something learned, we would write it down. Uh, then we had a retrospective discussion in team based on what went well, what went wrong, what needs to be improved for these lessons. And in the end, we had 12 major lessons learned. So about the, the lessons learned, we the first one is about briefing. Uh, the team putting effort to prospect hot topics for that specific person that's going to be interviewed. The inter about the interview itself, uh, understanding gameplay vocabulary in different regions because we are going to be challenged by the players. They are going to use uh, specific terms. Uh, so whoever is interviewing needs to, to know the game and need to know this vocabulary so they can uh, really uh, have, a, have a trade with the, the, the interviewed person. Uh, the third one, prioritization. Uh, results came really fast after we, the research was prioritized inside the, the, the team. Uh, about recruitment, we reached players that wanted to talk to us, but we know that there are others and how we are going to reach them in, uh, in this pandemic context or this remote, uh, remote, remote work context. So this is something that we are going to discuss for the next year. Uh, timing, the longer it, it takes from recruitment to interview, more problems appears. We saw that, uh, the last interviews, the scheduled interviews that we had, uh, people had a, a, right, a, a high uh, absence rate and couldn't uh, say yes to us. So they, oh no, I, I cannot be interviewed today. I can we schedule another time? Mm, not really. So uh, we had a, a high success rate 
uh, with dates close to the recruitment result. Uh, about teamwork, shared burden, different views, richer discussions. Discussion. So uh, this is the, the co-creation part of, of the, the process, and the, it's uh, when we you when you have different pr perspectives, it's going to make the results better. The excitement when interviewing players, uh, we had to change our script based on the player excitement. So they wanted to discuss a very specific point, and we wanted to talk about profile. Uh, we saw that okay, we can talk about profile later. Let's just hear the, this person excited talking about the game that they love. So we just changed the order of of question groups. Uh, the briefing part one. We detected that we would use an empathy map as a, a good debriefing tool, and we are going to test that in the future. The briefing part two, discussion goal is to fill a template table with key points. So uh, it's a kind of a system that we ended up using in the game or in the research. So uh, it, it made it faster too. So we, we knew which information needed to be there when discussing about the debriefing. Uh, the next point is UX maturity. We need to select which battles are worth fighting when you are in a company that you want to to help to, to rise the UX maturity level. So, for instance, the rewards. We gave VIP codes, but online shop vouchers are good in these times of pandemics. Uh, this is something that we may negotiate with the, the organization in the future. So, yeah, each battle... Uh, we, you need to select the battles you're, you're fighting. Uh, and the last point was the, the peaks. We tried to assess gameplay emotion peaks during the, the interview, but we failed, of course, because the best way to, to get this this emotion peaks is in another uh, in another approach. So watching a, a play test would be the perfect one. So we we just learned that okay, we can't. We can let let's stick to another thing. Uh, do you remember that uh, matrix that I mentioned with assumptions? So uh, the first one, 80% of the base preferred single player mode after playing all game modes. Not really. Uh, our main menu is based in single player preference. We detected that peop new players would just tap the first button in the menu, but this is something that we needed to investigate further because we in this, this in this moment of the research we had a, a, a ab testing running so now we have them the the result is that uh no the, it, it was not biasing uh players don't play certain multiplayer modes because it's impossible to find op opponents online not really uh the situation in this case uh they could find matches they 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 were not interested in these multiplayer modes. Uh, players play offline to avoid ads, making VIP less worthy. Uh, no, uh, we tried to to get this information in many different ways, but players don't really play offline to avoid avoid ads. So we need to check how how the the bridge between these data from our um, analytics and the, the behavior it's something that for for the future for us and the uh, player uh, don't play play with friends because they don't have friends who plays dominoes out of the game yeah we detected this they say that okay I wanted to play with my friends I try to invite them and we noticed that the main issue is with the play with friends gameplay flow uh, it has a lot of friction so we will improve that in the future F future uh, and about the questions, we were able to, to answer who are our personas, uh, Beto Battalion Team Costa, uh, what kind of game mode our players prefer. Uh, yeah, this is something curious because it's based on, on region. So, for instance, in the, the west of Brazil, they would rather play on a specific rule set. In the, for the Spanish players, they would they even uh, like to play uh, in a different orientation in the board so we got some nice data from this question uh, how many of our players would like to gamble yeah we were 
checking for f future features and uh, some of them replied about some questions about the gamble that it's something that we are planning uh, of course in the legal ways inside the game and uh, why do players play offline yeah as I said we need to investigate this further because uh, we have data that is saying to us that they are uh, escaping some ads but we couldn't detect how they are doing that or maybe this is a behavior that is related to the people that d didn't engage with the, the survey or the interviews and the last one uh, why is multiplayer gaming only 20 percent of the player base we what we really detected uh, was that uh, it's a mix people play the, the opponent depending on the, the current context for instance they're playing outside home they they house the just want to a quick match or they are relaxed at home they want to play against other players so this is something that we also can investigate further and uh, in understand the reason of this this value uh, I mentioned this a lot of times but I uh, want to make it even more important team discussion is really really uh, present uh, in, in all the, the stages. We had discussion sessions based on content presented in every result meeting. Uh, this way we align everyone with the deliverables, they analyze data from different perspectives. Uh, we could evaluate impact based on, on these areas too and decided action points. So the most relevant point, points were knowing our personas and their journeys, pain points, creating a connection between most impactful issues, bots, timers, and people abandoning the game, and our release plan for the game, uh, and understanding the difference between player profiles based on language for our personal research in the next year. So, uh, yeah, the, the, team, uh, were able, team, the team was able to see a high value, value in all these relevant points. So, uh, uh, in the closing takeaways, I would like to say that personas research is a continuous task. Uh, our research will continue, continue yearly, uh, and uh, this is something that uh, is important. As you saw, uh, there are some points that we may investigate further in the next year. We are living in a new world after COVID-19, and some behaviors change really fast. So it's really important or important to watch trends and understand behaviors to reach players accordingly. We are going to test new approaches in the future, and small wins build the path to a better UX maturity. So the results from this persona and relating them to action points inside our game development and having these on the release plans and the roadmap, uh, we can measure results and then like I said, select uh, harder battles and not not really battle because it's a, uh, everyone is the same boat as the company. So we can help to rise the UX maturity in, inside the company showing these results. And that's it. I would like to thank you to the to everyone that watched to the organization. And uh, for technical issues, uh, I was the one presenting this this, this work for you. But Vivian Mesquita was all the time. Uh, working with me in the presentation, the discussion. So here is our information. Feel free to contact us anytime. And that's it. Bye bye. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors Playtest Cloud, Player Research, Balsamic, Adobe, The Book. How to be a games user researcher, UX is fine, antidote, and sketch.
All this is possible thanks to our sponsors Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch. Hi everyone, my name is Günter Wallner and in this short talk I would like to discuss the use of Hexpin maps as a tool for games user research. As many games are inherently spatial, heat maps have become a popular and a quick way to observe the variation of a variable such as player deaths across an environment. Uh, continuous heat maps, like they are commonly used uh, in games user research, can make it however difficult to compare values between regions. Consider, for instance, the heat map on this slide, where it's pretty difficult to say if more deaths have happened in the more concise but more dense area A, or rather in the larger but less dense area B. Uh, moreover, heat maps are also usually restricted to a single or at most uh, two variables, which also makes it difficult to compare uh, different metrics within a single image. To compare multiple variables against each other and across a map, so-called hexpin maps can be very valuable. Uh, hexpin maps combine hexagonal pinning with some sort of visual cliff. The regular grid which is produced by the pinning facilitates uh, comparisons across areas and also makes it possible to compare data which has been captured at different points in time because uh, the subdivision is basically not affected by the actual distribution of the data. Uh, a glyph is then placed within each uh, cell, within each hexagon, to encode uh, the different variables. Here, uh, a so-called Wurman dot is used, which basically consists of two uh, circles. The outer circle indicates the uh, spatial area to which the data belongs to, and the inner circle uh, shows the actual data within uh, this area. Uh, these glyphs have the advantage that they are visually very simple and are also therefore easy to read when they become smaller. So here are a few examples of actual hex bin maps produced with data from StarCraft II. Uh, in its simplest form, it encodes one variable. So in that case, the number of destroyed units uh, within a cell, encoded by the size and the color of the inner circle. Uh, this map, in contrast, already shows two variables. The color of the outer circle shows the number of total destroyed units, while the inner circle uses a bipolar color scheme to indicate which of the two teams has lost more units. And this one, on the other hand, now already shows four different variables. Uh, two are encoded in the inner circle through its size and its color. One is encoded in the color of the outer circle. And the small arrows indicate from which sides the units have been attacked. We also assess the usefulness and efficiency of hex bin maps for analyzing game-related data uh, through an online study with around 200 participants and uh, almost 30 tasks. I can't go into too much detail here, but the uh, general takeaways of the user study were that uh, participants generally appreciate the, the display of multiple variables uh, within a single map and that the visualizations remained clean and structured uh, even when displaying three and four variables. 
uh, correctness achieved with the maps in terms of our estimating and uh, comparing values was also generally good, but sometimes also reduced by the actual visual encoding. As such, the visual encoding itself needs to be chosen with care as it can impact performance when working with these kind of maps. Uh, one also has to keep in mind that only a certain number of variables can be shown within an area of certain size. Also because the color coded areas need to have sufficient size to ensure that the colors can be perceived accurately. That's it uh, from my side. I hope this talk gave you at least a, a short impression of the value of hex bin maps for analyzing uh, spatial data. Uh, if you would like to know more about the results of the user study, I invite you to take a look at the paper. Uh, you can find the reference and the link to the paper here uh, on this slide. Uh, thanks for watching. Hello everyone, I'm Simone Kulisch and I'm happy to give a talk about how the game community makes use of social media, for example Twitter, in order to highlight what we can learn about player communities and which topics are relevant to them. Social media, including microblogging platforms such as Twitter, has become a useful and important communication channel for the game industry. To be in contact, to inform, to get feedback, and to communicate with the community. But what we can learn from this data, for example, which topics are relevant for the players? To better understanding of these communities, we conducted an explorative analysis of Twitter data using the game Destiny as a use case. And in addition, we investigate if there is a connection between this data and in-game data to obtain a more holistic view of microblocking behavior. In this analysis, we collected two datasets. First, we collected tweets related to Destiny using the API providing by Twitter. Here in total, we collected data over a 50 months period, resulting in over 1 million tweets from about 250,000 users. And second, here we searched the profiles of these users for Xbox Gamer Tags or PlayStation Network IDs, which we then used for our second dataset to get more information about the daily playing activity of the game, and this include data from about 3,500 players. Yeah, based on our analysis of data, we can see that general topics causing negative reaction are directly linked with the game itself, such as survey issue, long downloading times, or different or unfair treatment of Xbox and PlayStation versions. Therefore, it seems advisable to react proactively to such problems on social media platforms so that the community can see that their concerns are taken seriously and will be considered. 
Yeah, in contrast, positive received matters mainly concern the community, such as community organized charities or topics related to the game. Especially we observe that social conversation not directly related to the game were an important element in our data. Therefore, our recommendation is to actively support these activities, which can be contributed positively to community building and positive worth of mouth. Regarding Twitter and gameplay activity, tweets can also have, offer a valuable contextual information for understanding fluctuation in in-game activity, and game data can be useful identifier for events of interest. Twitter was also used to post fan art, and it seems to be a convincing way making fellow community members aware of one's creation. And furthermore, in periods of high in-game activity, usually after the release of a new content, we notice that players engage in preparing guides and then use Twitter to share them in a timely manner. So posting fan art or guides through official accounts can increase reach and is likely to please the creator as it shows that the developer cares about what fans are creating. And the last point which I would like to highlight is that we observe the players are using Twitter to look for teammates with whom they can play with. And this tweet showed us that this mainly takes place in an ad hoc fashion rather than in advance, which mostly like to to the nature of Twitter. Yeah, with this recommendation to support community effort, to react proactively if problems appear, to use in-game data in addition to Twitter data, for example, to get more information about event of interest, to advertise fan art or guides, and to support players to find teammates. With this recommendation, I'm at the end of my presentation. And thank you everyone for watching. Hi everyone, my name is Raphael, I am a UX researcher and walk psychologist and I'll be talking today about what your future employer wants you to do and how can future researcher and job seekers leverage that knowledge. So for a quick disclaimer, this presentation was inspired by an article that was published on UX Planet in February. It was called 2021 in demand skills for UX researchers and I wanted to do the same kind of analysis and report just that I wanted to focus it on game user research instead of general user research. So the data I used came from the game research user experience job board which was created by Steve Bromley. Um, I selected the last three years, so 2019, 2020, and 2021. I exported the, the job post on the 17th of September, and from that selection I could then um, have 97 posts. From these posts then I, I removed every irrelevant post that I couldn't use. So everything that was about uh, an internship or a PhD position, a professor position, or a job that was more about um, UX design or purely analytics 
was removed. And also um, drop post that didn't have any description or that had a link that was not working anymore. Um, I then had to remove these. So at the end, I had 73 posts that I used for the analysis. From these 72 had a, a valid description that I could use for at least some um, analysis. Of course, um, some of these posts have more description than others, but I then used what I could. And the idea is not to um, make any inferences here, but or to see if there are certain trends or patterns um, in the description of these posts and how the, the future researcher could use this knowledge. So for the seniority required, um, it is primarily mid position, then followed by senior position, and then finally junior position. So this kind of confirmed the idea that it is not that easy to get into this field as a junior or young graduate. Um, so something that could be a good idea is to first then get some experience as a user researcher in another field and then make a transition because very often in the job description they also mention that um, experience that you might have gotten from another field is also something that they value. For the location then, um, two thirds of the posts were from North America and a quarter was from Europe. Uh, this is mainly due to the fact that all the posts were English speaking positions. So everything outside of it is almost uh, non-existent. For the job links, um, 63 uh, of the positions were permanent and five were contract based. You also had five others that didn't clearly mention what was um, the length of it. As for the um, job title, you can see that there is quite a lot of variety here. So um, obviously was the most frequent ones are um, everything that is related to um, researcher. So the most common researcher titles are um, user researcher, UX researcher and games user researcher. Um, something to be aware of here is um, the different titles that can be used to talk about the same job, um, especially if you are trying to search for job titles online. It might be good to try these different terms and see if you find maybe more results that way because you might be missing on some of these if you can if you actually only use one of these two to search for jobs. So for the background, you can see that some are more um, common than others, but it also clearly shows that there is a lot of different paths you can take to actually reach a position as a game user researcher. So now I'm going to talk a bit more about the job description itself and the different skills and methods it contains. So in terms of skills, you can see that um, communication and collaboration are really key here and are at the top of the list. Um, so just after you have plan and execute, which is um, the idea of being able to run a study from the very beginning to the very end with all the different steps and activities that you might have in between. Then you have the research Im uh, improvement, which is basically the idea of trying to um, improve the current methodologies and processes that uh, you might use uh, in terms of research. And just after you have evangelizing, which is something a bit more um, oriented for senior level, but it is the idea of um, trying to spread the good, um, the good word about UX and research and the benefit that it can have on the, the development of games. And at the very bottom of the list, things are less commonly used or asked for. Uh, you can see that there is eye tracking, there is audio visual, visual software, um, developing UX strategy, these type of things. Mm, so here it's the same uh, skills again, but it is separated uh, in terms of the seniority level that is 
uh, asked for in the job post. Um, so there are different things you can see here. Um, first, you can see that communication and collaboration on the very left side are still very important for everyone and for all seniority level. Uh, you have planning and executing, which basically increase more and more with the seniority level. And this is the same um, for evangelizing the benefit of UX and research. And this makes sense since you would have a bit more um, expertise and um, people might listen to you a bit more, the more experience you have in this, in this field in the company. Um, you have the research improvement, which um, is something, as I said, mainly for senior and senior lead. And in terms of senior lead uh, skills, you have also then uh, things that are very specific to their position. So typically leadership or recruiting for the team, um, managing the team, establishing new, uh, new standards, these type of things. But you can also see that um, juniors have two things that are a bit more specific to their role. So you have um, recruiting for the playtest, so recruiting participant and setting up the lab um, for the same playtest. And so these are two activities that are also um, related to the playtest, not specifically during it, um, but it would be nice as a junior to have a bit of understanding already about these different tasks, what you might have, how it, how it takes place. Um, so you can also show that you understand how it, how it works and all the different steps you need to take before you actually run a playtest. So now about the, the methods. So here it's actually just shows that on average per post, um, the amount of methods you have mentioned in the description. So you can see that there is quite more for mid and senior positions uh, and less for junior and senior. And so for junior, it might just be that uh, recruiters expect you um, expect a bit less from you if you're a junior. But for senior lead, um, that is most likely due to the fact that they expect you to have a certain level of expertise in all these methods already. And very often also they just mention um, a certain knowledge in mixed methods without mentioning all the different methods. Uh, so that also reduces the, the occurrence of these different methods in the description. So this is all the uh, occurrence of the different methods in the descriptions. You can see that uh, at the very top you have playtest. Even though you can see that it is only more or less 55%, uh, which is not a lot, but it is also due to the fact that quite some job positions just ask for mixed methods and don't go into a lot of details about the different methods they want you to know. Uh, so that it is not really representative of um, the different job and what you would actually do there, but it is more like how often these terms are appearing in this description, I would say. Um, so you can see there's then playtest and survey, uh, statistics, interviews, and then heuristic evaluation. Um, in terms of statistics, it is rarely like a hard skill, uh, a hard uh, requirement. Um, so employers um, require you to have a basic knowledge of it, but they don't want you to have a very deep understanding of different statistic methods. It is a basic level that they want you to have. And at the very bottom of the list, you have other things like telemetry, uh, ethnography, diary studies, cut sorting, which are a bit less often mentioned in the, the job descriptions. So here it's the same idea. It's basically the the methods again, but separated in terms of seniority level. And there are also different things you can see here. Um, so for junior, mid and senior, playtest is still the main uh, and the most frequent, uh, frequently mentioned method uh, in the description. And juniors don't really need to have a lot of experience with statistics, as you can see. And this is the same for analytics, which is really not something they need to really uh, master yet at this point. Um, and there are two things that are more mentioned also for juniors. Um, so this is observation and managing the participant database, which is even though not mentioned that often, just a little bit more than in 10% of the cases, that might be something that as a junior, you might have to, to do all these tests that are all around the playtest and organizing it. So that might be good to 
be familiar with these different things as well and um, know a bit more about these things. There is really three things that is important here for junior researcher. Communication, collaboration and core knowledge. Communication because as a researcher your findings become more actionable and effective only if you communicate them effectively to people who can make these changes. Collaboration because you would have to not only collaborate with other researchers in your team but also with a lot of different teams that might be working on the same game. And a core knowledge of the different methods that are used in games and how the user experience is shaped um, in games. So basically recruiters don't expect you uh, as a junior to master a lot of different methods but you should be able to show them a good understanding and mastery of this 3C. So show them that you can communicate and collaborate effectively and that you understand how these different methods take place in games and that you have a good understanding of the user experience in video games. So that was it for me. If you want to ask me more questions or you would like to have access to the different um, data and graph that I made, don't hesitate to contact me either via Twitter or LinkedIn. Playtest Cloud is your destination for modern and effortless mobile usability and playtesting. Over 300 studios test their games with our panel of over 1 million players. These players help you discover why players play, how they play. Crux Online is sponsored by Balsamic. Balsamic Wireframes is the industry standard for rapid, low-fidelity wireframing. It combines the comfort and simplicity of paper sketching with the power of a digital tool so your work is easier to share, modify, and get honest feedback on. Crux Online is sponsored by Player Research. Player Research is the premier games user research partner enabling game dev to gain meaningful insight from real players across the world. Delivering actionable insights on usability, UX, appeal and play so that you can focus on the game.
welcome to another episode of Gur Cafe. I'm your host, Lainey. Join me and my colleagues, Ollie and Seb, as we discuss varying topics around all things games user research. We've got you covered, whether you're just getting started in Gur, been around for a while, or are simply interested in learning more. We have a lot to talk about, so grab your favorite drink and let's jump right in to today's episode. All right, Ollie, hi. Hi, Lainey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, very well, thank you. Good. Welcome to our very special episode for the Grux Online Summit. We're super happy today to chat about a little, we're doing a little bit of a different format. Uh, first of all, our, our lovely friend Seb is, uh, is away today, so it's just going to be Ollie and I having a conversation, but looking forward to it. We have many of these. And so it should be just like our usual conversations of chatting about topics that we enjoy. Yep, yep, but Seb, you will be missed. Yes, we will, uh, we'll have Seb next time for sure. So, but topic of today is, is a little bit of an interesting one because we're actually going to be discussing a talk that was previously given at the Games You Are Summit in 2019 in San Francisco by our colleague, Julian. Uh, the name of the talk is How Can We Blend UR Into the Design Cycle? So I'll pause right here really quick. If you have the opportunity to put us on pause and go check out that talk, we highly recommend it. We are going to cover a lot of the high level pieces uh, of the content that Julian discusses, but it's one of my favorite talks. I know Ollie feels the same. Please go check it out. We'll have everything linked for you as well so that you'll know exactly which one to go uh, and talk to and maybe come back or at least go check it out when you're when you're done listening to this. So uh, I, I think I've expressed multiple times uh, to Julian <laughs> my love for this talk. Uh, we used to we worked together back then when he when he was preparing it. Um, and I think I feel I feel like I bring it up quite frequently uh, with my team. So it's it's kind of a, a little bit of a talk about kind of influence and being blended into the design cycle. So giving some context, uh, so becoming implicated into the design iteration process is a key piece to long-term UR buy-in and impact. I think we can probably all agree to that. And becoming blended with the design cycle is certainly a task easier said than done. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And before we get into the topic, I actually want to pause to define these two terms because we're going to be talking about embedded. We're going to be talking about being blended and I want to make sure we understand the difference for our audience here. Um, so when I'm when we're referring to embedded researchers, because typically most of our researchers here at Ubisoft are embedded. This means that they are researchers typically seated physically or virtually uh, with the design team and they're typically full time dedicated individuals working on a, a sole project. So working with a particular design team, a certain uh, brand or production. When we're talking about blended, this means it's more being implicated, right? It's being a part of the of the process, not only just kind of adjacent to it. So being in close proximity does not necessarily mean that you are blended. So embedded does not necessarily mean that you're in blended and you don't have to be embedded to be blended. <laughs> uh, and we can touch That's later. Helps, so. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can touch on that a little bit later, especially when we're going to be talking about uh, the more recent impact of COVID and how that's kind of impacted our ability to be blended with our teams to kind of build and maintain relationships. But just wanted to kind of set the, the groundwork of these two different terms so we're not confused as we're discussing. So, Ollie, I'm going to have you give us a, a little bit of a rundown of some of the topics uh, that, that Julian was discussing in that talk. So, let's discuss first some of the current problems that we face as user researchers that are perhaps kind of preventing us from being really blended uh yeah thank you thanks lenny uh yeah and uh, yeah of course i'm going to uh, kind of paraphrase some of the talk content so again uh, go back to it uh, if you want to have uh, the, the the full presentation um 
But yeah, uh, one of the 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 the, the first aspect that uh, Julien uh, is mentioning in his talk is uh, how our our tendency to arrive uh, too late sometimes uh, in the production cycle to be uh, really impactful, and. <clears throat> To be honest, it's not just a game user research problem. It's, I mean, uh, the being too late uh, in the development cycle is, I believe, as old as the user research itself. Uh, but that's certainly something that we keep experiencing uh, in the gaming industry. And um, I think, uh, again, uh, referencing the talk, uh, I, I love the graph that shows, you know, the uh, ROI of the research uh, as compared to uh, where you are in the production and also the level of stress of the production, because that's that's maybe something that is specific to games as compared to other products. Uh, I'm not sure there's so much stress near to launch when you're launching a website versus launching a game. <clears throat> so it, it adds an additional an additional layer on uh, yeah why uh, yeah testing too late or being too late uh, is not uh, is not the most impactful. So uh, of course, first reason being that uh, everything is pretty much set in stone. So uh, if you arrive at that point, uh, even though you have uh, really great insights about how to improve the game, it's very unlikely that the game is going to be changed uh, this deeply anyways. So that's <clears throat> that's really your first thing. And it's there's a reason for that. I mean, it's just, I mean, um, yeah, as, as, you, as you know, it's uh, near the end of the production. Uh, usually the, uh, the the HQ wants to have visibility on the state of the game. So it makes sense that we do those kind of game assessment very late in production uh, because, yeah, we and we, we should still be doing that at some point. So uh, but not just that or not just arriving at that moment. Um, so that that's one thing. It's it's late, but it can also be late in the, the at a more micro level uh, because uh, uh, I think you experience that, uh, Lenny, uh, the, when you uh, offer to uh, uh, do a testing on an early concept and people will tell you, uh, uh, no, but it's not ready yet. I cannot show yep. it to real users because it's not ready yet. So uh, I don't want to know if you want to give examples on that or if I <laughs> shall continue. But, yeah, uh, no, but I think I think it's an interesting one because you think about, and I, and I love the graph that you were referencing that's in Julian's talk because I think it is kind of this, it's, there is this kind of cascading, like we're losing that ability to influence and impact and really become that kind of blended individual that we want to over time. But it's not necessarily that you come in early that like guarantees that you're going to be able to have a lot of uh, influence and impact because there is some kind of education that needs to come into into play when you're coming in early, kind of helping people understand that it's not necessarily too early and kind of working through some of that kind of initial stress and anxiety. So I think coming in late is the more kind of classic problem, I think that many of us face as a more universal way, but it also, like you said, it can be reflected on the flip side of coming in so early. If you don't have the experience of working with, with uh, the design teams that are accustomed to working with researchers or quote unquote external individuals to get that feedback, to not feel like you're dictating the design process. And we're gonna to touch on that a few times over the course of what we're chatting about today is that it's not about this loss of creativity, right? It's about helping inform and make, help them feel more confident in the decisions that they are making. And we, we see as that as kind of one of the current problems that we're facing if we're coming in too late or we're coming in too early and we're not well positioned or our teams are not prepared to work with us, we can have similar problems, whether we're at the beginning or the end. Yeah, and you know that that makes me think of this uh, famous uh, sentence. You know, uh, test test early, test often. I think yeah. <coughs> it's 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 not a, a wrong sentence, but uh, maybe we should phrase it differently, like. Uh, uh, do research early, do research often, because uh, uh, you know more often than not, user research is associated with testing, and testing uh, is associated associated sorry with assessing and not yeah. and not helping to design. Right? So when we test something, we want to see if it works or if it doesn't work, and that's. That's definitely an important part of the process, but uh, sometimes it's the only part or the only way that uh, we uh, collaborate uh, with productions. And uh, obviously, when we do that, it means that we don't really have a say about the decisions that, I, that are being made. So 
it's definitely a missed opportunity because yeah, we can tell if what they decided works or doesn't work, but we're missing the spot when it comes to really uh, providing useful information to help them make their decision in the first place. I think it, it touches on a bit of that kind of mentality that, that Julian talks a little bit about this kind of firefighter versus uh, like a builder where you've got this firefighter mentality where you're kind of just a little bit on the outside all the time. Like you're, you've got this kind of sense for maybe I don't understand why this decision is being made or I'm not involved enough to be able to get full understanding as to, well, they didn't fix this issue or they didn't fix this thing. And it feels a little bit like, well, I said that this was a problem. Why, why didn't they address it? And it's kind of how we're presenting ourselves within that space. If we're constantly just there to say like, okay, yeah, like that thing, that thing worked. All right. See you later. Um, maybe that's feeding in a little bit to that and to some extent, I think. Yes, definitely, and uh, we know that uh, that's also um, uh, it's, it's it's quite uh, common that uh, uh, junior they just want to run tests, you know, because this is yeah. what they've been trained for. So yeah, yeah, I want to run that test. I want to have participants, and I want to uh, to 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 answer that question, etc. And and that's good. I mean, again, that's an important part of There's the process. There's a place for that. But, but but you know, it's it's yeah, it's it's just it, it's interesting because somehow it uh, sustain this kind of position that we think we are too much in about the, 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 the validators. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this is uh, what the juniors want to do that. And I can perfectly understand that because, you know, they, were, they won't like you to, to, to polish their weapons and to learn to do those, uh, those, 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 uh, those methods, etc. But in the end, um, <clears throat> If, if it's just that, uh, I think no one's uh, a winner at the end of the day. I mean, uh, neither the production and neither us, because um, uh, I can perfectly see, uh, you know, as you were telling, hey, why did why didn't they do uh, this change uh, that I reported since last time? So uh, we have seen that, you know, uh, the, the frustration that it can generate already for the user researcher to have the, the, the feeling that what they are doing is not taken into account, etc., etc. But also probably on the production side, you know, just uh, having this kind of uh, anxiety, as you were telling, and that uh, mm -hmm. Julien is mentioning in the talk that, uh, oh, what are they going to think about my design? And uh, am I going to have a good rating or am I going to have a, 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 a bad rating. So mm -hmm. it, it's just a stressful and uh, let's say uh, unsatisfying situation for uh, yeah. everyone, I believe. Uh, when it could be, it could be otherwise, but yeah. being otherwise means being blended and uh, doing test after test mm -hmm. is not being blended. Yeah, I, you've touched on so many wonderful topics that I want to talk about. <laughs> But I think I, I think one them. of them <laughs> I think one of them is yeah like it's it's this kind of discussion of comfort almost initially when you're coming in as a junior and you really want to show your stuff. I want to show my methods. I want to do this like really interesting pieces of research and that's fantastic and there's definitely a place for that. And you know, you and I have talked about this. I talk about it with my team all the time. It's like validating things is okay. Coming in and saying like, yes, this thing worked as intended is always going to be okay. But it's about finding that balance between I'm only ever validating decisions versus I'm also being able to come in and provide insights to help, you know, lead discussions and that are going to lead to decision making. And so there's all of these kind of pieces coming together. And I think when you're, it's easy to kind of get stuck in, I'm just kind of, I'm here, I'm doing my methods, I'm doing this, I'm getting, I'm getting their questions, I'm delivering this thing. And then easy, it's easy to kind of just walk away from that. And I think that often does lead to this kind of stress and anxiety, right? Like having worked with Julian, he and I worked on Siege. He was the, um, the cell owner when I was an analyst on, on Siege. And he would say all the time, and he says it in the talk, like if it's, if it's always stressful, something is wrong and that goes for either side like you said if it's always stressful for your analyst that's not an ideal situation and if it's always stressful for your partners oh i don't know what rating i'm going to get i don't know what this feedback is going to be is it going to be bad is it going to be good you've got some missed opportunities 
and you've got this option for really becoming more blended, right? So it's like if we're continually coming in too late where we're not able to have the impact and the influence, if we're too often ending up being the ones to kind of just strictly validate decisions and we've got this mentality like this firefighter mentality of it that julian describes it's like these are all these kind of qualities of like an unhealthy or like an imbalanced relationship with user research and design and it's it's because we are it can be impacted by kind of how we're presenting ourselves and what we're able to do and how what our role there is right there's a lot of education opportunities and i think well obviously we all want to strive for a <laughs> more stress-free relationship uh, with our designers and our partners and uh, we don't want to be experiencing stress and anxiety on our side when we're running research we want to understand why changes are being made we want to ensure that things are being fixed upon when we're bringing up issues so i want to touch a little bit on then what does good look like Right, so we've talked on like, okay, what some of the problems that we're facing are, uh, but how do we get to the point where we're able to kind of maybe own or become, you know, own some of this iteration process or become blended? Yeah, and since we are talking about the the, the, the testing loop, I think that uh, yeah, a first point that we can bring is that uh, yeah, uh, let's remember that test is not the answer uh, to everything. It should never be. I mean, it's just uh, and uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's easier said than done because it's also uh, some kind of widely spread stereotype on the productions that uh, this is what the, the the user research labs are doing. They are doing tests, you know. They are doing those uh, play tests, you know, a word that I you know I don't like that much because uh, <laughs> it means it, 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 it means thing that is a very let's say a uh, reduced way of uh, describing the research yeah. um, but also because you know uh, they, they want some tests we do some tests and sometimes it's difficult to 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 extract ourselves from that loop you know uh, you're, you're all telling yeah of course we want to do it differently but sometimes when you are when you are stuck uh, on on that loop it can get difficult because you're anyway always uh, running, running, running to do the next test, so you, you don't even have the bandwidth to, uh, to 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 get out of this. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, a, a simple thing is just to, to let, let's just remember that uh, test is a tool, and that's just a tool. And we have many tools in our uh, research or toolbox, which is uh, why I love so much that <laughs> uh, our craft. It's because you know there's so much way to 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 answer a question, and and uh, again, it's just switching from that uh, what research am I going to run to what insight do they need uh, to, to make their decision and what do, what do they need them uh, is I think uh, a good starting point because uh, maybe you're more thinking about uh, what's going on in the production than uh, what method do I have to put in place and uh, what are my participants going to look like. Um, I mean th these are just means to uh, to, 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 to to produce what the, the production needs, but first we need to understand what the production needs. And sometimes we kind of not fail that step, that step but may, maybe don't have all the conversations that are uh, required to uh, to get a full understanding and visibility on how we can be most efficient to our mm -hmm. stakeholders. And I think it's difficult too when you're when you are a little bit fresher and newer in the job as a researcher to feel really confident with all of these methods that are in your toolkit right you kind of like roll up on the production you got your big toolbox and you're just like all right now what <laughs> it's trying to kind of figure yeah, out like okay so I've got all these things and I've got these different things that I can do and it feels in, it feels very counterintuitive to say don't start doing research yet because like that's what you were there for and like that's what your job is <laughs> yeah, right. but it's like no just go talk to people just go understand right it's we need to understand where we are where we want to be but we also really need to understand where we've come from and that's regardless of the of the state of the game that you're on right it's that if you're trying to continue to if you're coming in at any point and during the production conception whatever of the de game development cycle it's really important to be able to understand where where you are and how that fits in and 
that's how you're really becoming that a partner, right? You're not just becoming this like support role where it's like, okay, here I am. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to test. It's looking at, okay, so I'm, I'm giving more consideration to kind of what's going on around me. And I'm thinking about, okay, how do I use my, the tools in my toolkit more efficiently? And maybe I'm not using as many as I thought I was going to use sometimes, but it's kind of becoming more involved in some of these conversations and making sure that we are utilizing them as efficiently as possible when we are running a test. Yeah, and you you are saying how we can become partners, but uh, I, I would I, I would dare to go one step further. But I think that we somehow need to become part of the team. We we, we yes. need to become part of the production team because um, <clears throat> uh, I remember from discussion I had with uh, analysts in the past. Uh, it's, I heard a couple of times saying, "Yeah, yeah, they're seeing us as a part of the team." They told us, "You are part of the team," you know, and and, and I think when when you reach that level of collaboration, uh, then uh, it's maybe not be perfect, but that's at least you're not the, the service anymore. You are really someone yeah. working with the team and they feel that you have the same drive that they do to uh, make the project a success and the game a success, etc. And it, change, it changes a lot the, the kind of discussion that you can have with them because then uh, when you become a, a trusted partner or kind of a team member, uh, I think that people open up way more about their challenges, what they yes. are trying to do, what they need to address, etc. And this is the gold mine that you need to have access to to uh, be the most relevant in your work. I think you're also able to anticipate some of those challenges as well when you're really when you're really there to be able to be involved in the conversations and see where they're going, what the decisions are being taken and you know and that's 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 what this kind of blended definition is that we're really discussing it's you know when Julian's in his talk he's talking a little bit about blended as kind of like owning this kind of portion of the iteration process and I think owning some aspect of the design cycle right and I think that can manifest in a lot of different ways and it's going to depend on the game you know the, the product the cell the individuals the the researcher and I think it can it can look a lot differently kind of depending on your own individual experience as well if you're a little bit newer a little bit more junior in the role that can be maybe being a bit more of a discussion facilitator in some of these things maybe you're involved in a design workshop and you're kind of helping moderate that discussion with some of the designers and some of the directors and other individuals from the team if you're more of a senior level role maybe it's just sitting in directors review meetings and providing insights and asking questions, right? It's influence isn't only about having answers, it's about asking the right questions and getting people to think about things in a different way. And so it's not this like one stop, one kind of way of doing it. It's, it, there is that level of flexibility there as well. So I think the most interesting thing that we can chat a little bit about now is kind of, okay, I think we're all in agreement that this is like a really good thing, but like, how do we get there? How do we get to the point where we're able to be moving past kind of these support characters and we're more into the partners where we are more blended and maybe we have this more kind of healthy relationship, but how, how do we do that with our teams? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you 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 hinted a little of it. I think uh, in what you said, uh, it's uh, and uh, again, uh, yeah, we're going to talk again about the importance of of communication that we already uh, discussed uh, in a, in a previous episode. But uh, yeah, uh, when you join the project, don't. So don't rush to know when you are going to do your first test or your first piece of research. It's uh, it's talking first. It's, it's understanding where you are, understanding the the, the, the context, and uh, um, as uh, intimidating it can uh, look to maybe more uh, junior people, it can be as simple as just you know taking around and uh, seeing a designer and say hey hello, uh, introduce yourself and say hey what are you working on? Uh, oh, you're working on that part, and uh, how does that work with the game? Just just being curious, you know. Um, yeah. 
pe people like it when uh, when someone is interested in their uh, job. So uh, uh, I, I won't see people telling you, no, I don't want to tell you about my job. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't say it never happens, but usually people are interested. Yeah, and that's, for sure. And, and that's a nice way to, uh, to, to, to create some kind of bond. You know, they, they need to understand that uh, we are genuinely interested in uh, what they are trying to achieve and that we are first uh, uh, not just coming and say, hey, we should test this, but just trying to understand what they do and uh, what are their challenges, what are the uncertainties that they have, the directions, etc. Um, it, it's super interesting because uh, even from those conversations, you can tr start to identify yourself uh, possibilities for research yes. or things that where you believe that yeah your skills might be helpful because um, again we, we we can't expect from my stakeholders to uh, know when and how to do research because otherwise we wouldn't have a job right so yep. uh, yeah it's, it's also up to us to say hey you know oh you're asking your question you know that <clears throat> if we did this little piece of research, I could bring you insight about that. That could be a starting point, you know, to uh, to, to, to to try to get on board and that they see you as uh, the person that helps and not the person that gives the rating. Yeah, and it's the and it goes, I think, really nicely into providing that consistent level of support. You know, you're not just kind of coming in at a peak and where things get stressful and then kind of going away. It's these constant conversations. It's like, yeah, you know what? We can run like a small internal thing. I can do a review. I can go ask a couple people what they think. We can sit down and have a play session, have a play test, an internal thing. And that's super helpful to build trust with the with those individuals, like you were saying. I think it also really helps fight that test anxiety that we see a lot when you kind of are coming and going and maybe they don't see you very often and you come in and then suddenly you have like this 90 page user test report. Yeah, okay. Uh, but it, it helps kind of remove that surprise effect of, you know, here we are, we can do a lot of different things, help educate them on what we can do. You know, it's, it's this education, it's the evangelism, it's building those relationships with the team. It, help set expectations of what our role is and how we can help them. Because if you just go in, you're like, yeah, we can we can get feedback from people on on any of your pieces of content that you would like. It's really difficult for somebody to decide like, OK, well, how do I know when it's ready? How do I know who I need to talk to? Uh, do I need to decide what the questions are that you ask? Do I need to set the you know, how, how are you going to do this? Are they going to play? Do I have to like think of questions that we're going to ask them? It, it allows you to kind of guide that narrative almost with them and help them kind of understand the different ways in which you can provide that assistance. And maybe it is, you know, running the internal play sessions. That's a good example that, that Julian uses during the talk. And that was something that was uh, pretty big for us back on Siege like many years ago was that was how we became that's how we built really healthy relationships with our design teams was really taking ownership of this play session process that they were already doing. And we felt like, oh, well, if we just come in and we tweak just small little bits and they get more and more and more comfortable with us, we can actually leverage that in a lot of really different and unique ways. And it allowed us to get very creative, right? There's obviously there's a lot of people that are probably listening who are screaming, thinking like these internal play sessions have a lot of inherent bias and all the things that are going, maybe the more negative aspects of those things. But we use that to our benefit. We we were able to, you know, Julian talks about this kind of black box effect when we're talking about the design and iteration and it when it feels like we're not having that consistent support, you know, going back to that firefighter mentality, we're not always sure what's being done, when it's being done. But if we're there and maybe we're providing more kind of consistent level of support, we're involved in conversations, we have visibility, we can kind of keep tabs on what's going on. Yeah, and it's being involved that brings all those uh, opportunities Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, yeah, leveraging activities that they already do is a very good uh, entry point that uh, you used uh, on Rainbow Six and that we used on other uh, productions uh, as well. And that opened up like possibilities to, uh, hey, uh, OK, so we've done a couple of play sessions and we see that 
uh, several times people complain about this, but we don't know exactly why. And then you say, hey, we could we could help go d dig deeper into this. We could have, I don't know, a, a small internal uh, test session, usability test session with people that are outside of the production and start digging uh, about this. Or I don't know, maybe uh, maybe they are uh, they express concern about their target audience and they don't they they have missing information about the target audience. Then we could do some exploratory research and uh, interview the target audience and get some insights. So again, it's 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 really I mean, it's it's a it's a virtuous circle really. It's yeah. the more the more you're part of the discussions, and the more it becomes like obvious in a way uh, mm -hmm. where you can be helpful and even on productions that may be reluctant because you may you may have those ideas but uh, maybe the the, 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 the for uh, some reason the productions won't really let you do that or say oh no we don't mm -hmm. do that etc because sometimes they don't understand the value that they can get out of it yeah uh, I, I think another good tip that has been used <laughs> not only in the game user research industry in the past is just do it for free do your research for yeah. free and bring them some results I mean um, um, yeah, I, I remember uh, we, we had in the past a production that was uh, really reluctant to uh, use our research and it took one test to completely flip their, or one research to completely flip, flip their mindset because they had this kind of uh, idea of maybe yeah, the validator thing, probably the validator yeah. thing, uh, by the way, and then they say, oh, but they can actually bring us different kind of insight and once they get that once and they get the really the value out of it, mm -hmm. then then it opens up a completely different collaboration. But of course, you still have to be listening a lot because you don't want to miss that first step. So you yeah. don't, because you need to be relevant, but be relevant once and then uh, the, the, the door is maybe not fully open, but it's way more yeah. open than it was uh, before. For sure, and it's it's being very mindful about the strategy of the user research the, you know, the research strategy alongside the production strategy or the conception or anything. It's really understanding how we can complement that process. It's not losing our own identity into there. It's ensuring that we're able to provide the insights when they matter and be able to be in part of those conversations and recognizing that if we're looking at like, okay, well, there's a gate, you know, this month and then in three months, there's another gate. I'm going to do a test before and a test before the next one. That also makes it very clear that you have, you know, two and a half months of in between time that you can get very creative. You can take time to sit and talk with them, listen, provide reviews of past research that has been done to be able to do competitive analysis, any sort of different aspects of you know, providing information to just kind of facilitate conversation and kind of fight that the, the black box of being kind of shut out from all of that and being- And the anxiety. Of, yes. And the anxiety yes. on the production side, because I mean, uh, it's, it's it makes a difference between, uh, hey, we just pop out of the blue and we are going to assess yeah. your game versus uh, we work together for all these months to make sure that this gate where we need to have a test and we need to make this assessment is going to go uh, as well as it possibly can because uh, we try to feed you with information to make the right decision to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think, so I want to touch on an interesting aspect of this kind of relationship building, getting to the point of being blended, uh, because obviously a lot has changed since Julian kind of gave this talk a couple of years ago, uh, the big one being COVID. <laughs> um, oh yeah, that thing. <laughs> that one little thing, um, because I think it's, you know, when we're talking about embedded and being blended and things like that, you know, we're talking about these opportunities of like, oh, I'm walking by a designer's desk. Oh, hey, like, what are you working on? How are things going? Like, what are you up to? Like, what's what's happening? Or even just walking by someone's desk and seeing a stand up meeting and going over and joining. Right. There's a lot of this. A lot of our day to day life has changed. Right. Like I was an analyst pre COVID. So I have a lot of this ways of kind of how I was handling things. And now in the, the COVID era of, of the, our work, I have my analysts that are trying to manage this now in, okay, well, I don't get to just like see what they're working on. It's very different. And so I actually asked them, 
you know, hey, let's all let's have a conversation. Like, how do we? So a good half a portion of my team was here pre-COVID. Uh, a good portion of the team has joined uh, post-COVID or during. I don't know if we're every we're, we're current COVID times, I guess. Still, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, it's still difficult to have a coffee chat these days. Yeah, exactly. You can't really uh, see people a lot of face to face. The majority. So for context, um, we are still very much remote. Uh, I know that there are other studios around the globe that are potentially doing more in-person research, but we do have some of our individuals who work in the office. We do have some individuals on design teams and production teams that are in the office. But for the most part, we are still working remote. Our, our research is remote. We're running online tests and we can probably do a whole other episode um, of how we manage remote testing. But obviously, you know, a lot of our analysts right now don't have the luxury of just walking by someone's desk and saying, hey, what are you doing? Social distancing, maybe they're not in the office, all these different things. So, you know, I asked them, you know, what has changed when it comes to building these relationships, becoming blended, um, you know, and for better or for worse. And there was a lot of conversation about, like, documentation where there is a lot more kind of written documentation available, at least for a lot of the teams that they're working with and how that's been super helpful for them to prepare more meaningfully to go into conversations and be more efficient because they don't have to just rely on like catching that one person at their desk that one day when they had some free time is because majority of us are working remotely a lot more kind of time is being put into design documentation and so it's been a, it's been easier for them to do some of their homework about where where we have been what decisions already have been made what changes have been made to to the design so the researchers are coming in much more informed when they're going into discussions more often because they're able to find that information or they're at least feeling much more confident in being able to go in and ask the right questions to reduce the time of kind of spinning wheels of like oh yeah well that's just that's in the design documents you know you can go find that somewhere so i think that was something that was kind of interesting for a lot of them is just how a custom we've all had to become to having information available and it definitely has made things a lot better i think some things that some of them mentioned to me about different strategies that they've had to kind of build relationships a little bit more efficiently was changing the way that we deliver findings um there's a, the tendency to kind of have this kind of one catch-all report with all of our findings and delivering that over to our stakeholders. Uh, but what some of them are finding is that it actually is much more um, efficient and kind of keeps the conversation going when they can have more kind of a quick ad hoc meeting, like right after a test, discuss some high level findings, have a discussion with the team, and then have, you know, maybe a top findings, a more condensed report, and then maybe something that comes a little bit later. But they're trying to find strategies to kind of keep the conversation going. So they don't see them, you know, just up on the floor at their desk. And so they're specifically scheduling like, 15 minute meetings to go over some initial things, keeping the conversation going, letting them know, hey, I'm here, I ran this research, this is a thing that we did. So they're not not seeing us as well. Yeah, that's interesting to uh, see that this is happening now uh, with the, the, the remote setting uh, when it maybe was not happening so much uh, with the in-person, but uh, that's good. I hope this is habits that are going to uh, carry over the return to, 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 to the office because they are definitely uh, good habits. I'm, I'm wondering if, if this is something that uh, your uh, team talked to you about because, of course, I'm even uh, further from the operations that you are uh, <laughs> now. Um, but I, I would tend to believe that uh, because you uh, you don't have all these informal or casual, you know, meetings that uh, you could have, that 
does it doesn't make it even more important to be invited at the right meeting because if you're not at that meeting there's no chance that you hear about it at the coffee machine you know yep. uh, I'm just wondering if you had any uh, insight from your team about that yeah i think a couple of them kind of mentioned something similar to that where especially some of our newer folks have struggled to kind of find more casual ways to get to know people it's been difficult for them to sometimes make their way into the inner circle <laughs> of the production team because yeah there's not this opportunity to just walk by and introduce yourself there uh, things feel a lot more formal right for like for better or for worse and so yeah there is that pressure where it's like oh well you know were you invited to that play session it's it feels like when i was chatting with one of my analysts today it feels a little bit like you have to do a little bit more work to like get that invite to something, whereas maybe we didn't have to do that as much before. And so, you know, going back into this idea that we're providing, you know, quicker, snappier insights as, as frequently as we can, kind of keeping keeping them thinking about us and kind of keeping them thinking like, hey, we're here because, yeah, it's not as common to just be like, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to swing by Lainey's desk. I see her there. I'm going to go chat with her and we're going to have this quick little conversation they're not getting that same level. And so they do have to put in a, a decent amount of extra work to really foster those relationships to be able to be in. And I think that it is it is much more difficult because mm. you you miss that casual nature of some of the like kind of water cooler or coffee coffee chats. Yeah, and that's interesting yeah, that you are mentioning the, the the PlayStation because we were talking earlier about the PlayStation and how we could help moderate them, etc. But uh, uh, just participating in them is, is it can, yes. can, can be some help, and and especially these days with the the, the COVID situation. You know, uh, uh, I remember a, a couple of months ago we had a newcomer, and I was talking to uh, someone on the production. They were uh, working. On and I was saying, oh, is it go how is it going, etc. And you thought, yeah, it's going great, but uh, uh, they, uh, they they should do a little more effort to get themselves known by the production. And that person was telling me uh, they, they they should they should just join our play session and just play the game with us, you know, just so that people see that hey, you're interested in the game and uh, you're playing the game and you're getting yourself known as someone who enjoys the project before being a, a user researcher. And that's I think that's that that. that that's something that is super important, no matter the situation. But uh, since, yeah, playing PlayStation is thankfully something that we can still do remotely, that's kind of a casual activity that is available now and that, uh, yeah, we could probably leverage to uh, yes. foster that, you know, or get the, that initial relationship uh, with yes. the people we are working with. For sure. And I think that segues like really perfectly into the next topic that I wanted to discuss a little bit. It's like, you know, like how do we put this into practice, right? Like how do we become blended? How do we build these relationships? And, you know, I think touching back to the to the talk from Julian, he does specifically mention play sessions and how we managed to do that was exactly the situation you were describing. It was just us initially showing up and playing with the team to try and like, hey, here we are, like what's going on? Trying to keep up to date, trying to learn the game, trying to just have our presence known. And that like evolved to us really taking over that process, implementing a lot of processes, teaching the teams how to run more efficient, more effective play sessions, getting the feedback that they needed. And for a couple of years, we were very, very implicated in the play sessions. It was within the last couple of years now that we've moved away from doing that but that was really the kind of springboard for i mean and that was during my time when i was on the project is really getting people to know me being able to get to know the designers being able to kind of really empathize with them on what was going on and it really was a fairly easy in a, like cheap way <laughs> of getting involved and really being able to kind of become a part of things. And that really did allow me specifically, and also the other analysts that I was working with, be able to build our partnerships and our relationships with the team and get that more kind of global influence through giving them like a very easy thing that they were very accustomed to, right? 
most of our teams are probably running their own internal play sessions. There's some quick wins there for sure to be able to come in and say, hey, like, let me just phrase some questions for you, write a survey, do a quick little like write up of the of the discussion points. And that really led to us getting to the point where we weren't, we were so busy doing so much research, we couldn't actually facilitate running the play sessions anymore. We, we did end up dropping them at some point because we had so much other work because we were so implicated in all the design cycle through all the different seasons on Siege, we were so busy. And I think it was a really interesting kind of evolution of how we used that to leverage our kind of that, get that door open to coming in to with the team. Yeah, and uh, we did that on other projects as well, yes. and we keep doing that on other projects because that's a, that's an excellent entry point. Uh, I mean, um, I remember a couple of years ago uh, when uh, we we first uh, started to help on PlayStation just to gather production feedback on some of the, and as you said, yeah, we know it's biased, etc. but it's still better than nothing. And uh, uh, truth be told, the big issues that you get from there are usually issues that you want to take a look at, you know, it's not because it's the production yep, that sure. uh, you should just disregard those. And this is when we uh, could do our very first internal usability test, you know, on very early features, because we were exactly in that situation where at the same uh, comments were popping up again and again and again, and uh, we said, hey, we could do something else. Uh, you, you know this is happening, you don't know why, we can help you with that. And this is how we we, we, we got the ball rolling on that. So um, th there are other ways to do it, but PlayStation still is a very good way because as you said, they are doing it anyways. So we are just bringing value uh, to an activity they are doing at absolutely no or very little extra effort uh, yeah. from them. So so that's a, that's a very good entry point to start building that, uh, that collaboration. Uh, I was thinking about other ways uh, that um, we did build that or that we could build that or what, that we started uh, to, 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 to build that. Um, there's one I think you could, you could, uh, you could speak about because uh, I think that's a very good one. You know, it's the, uh, uh, the, 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 the conversation that you started to have with this uh, very early production, you know, that was, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so maybe you want to <laughs> Keeping say Keeping an because... NDA as much as possible, I'm like, mm, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's one that I cannot talk yeah. about, but uh, yeah, yeah, I no. think you can talk about the experience because that's a very good example, I believe. Yeah, for sure. I think to give as much context as I can, um, I had done a lot of really interesting research during my time on Siege and really understanding, you know, there, there's there's talks about it online, the learning study, uh, this very, you know, discussed uh, piece of research that we did back with Siege of learning how players learned the game. And we spent a lot of time and we've done a lot of research building off of that in the last kind of however many years now. And really thinking about how players are, are learning these kind of tactical shooter games or just kind of shooter games in general, games that have a lot of kind of complex variables, PVP. And we really kind of were able to take a step back and provides kind of high level information for a game that was like so so early in conception <laughs> like still initial conversations and we were able to go in and I was able to present to them a lot of the the research that we had done kind of years and years ago on Siege to help kind of inform them on like, hey, here's some of the pitfalls and some of the things that we experienced if you're doing something similar to these mechanics or this specific kind of aspect of the game, here's some things that you should consider. And yeah, I mean, that was a, a really inexpensive way. It just took a couple of hours of my time to go sit and kind of run a little bit of a workshop with them. They brought to me some ideas of, hey, we were thinking about doing this. I was able to even go back and find even past pieces of research. And I wasn't doing any new research. This was all something that had been done years ago. And it was just kind of digging that out of my memory bank and the kind of online wiki of here's some different examples and some different things to consider. And yeah, it was a great way of kind of segueing into different conversations and being very implicated at a very early stage when there was 
nothing playable, nothing more than just some documentation and some storyboarding and being able to kind of influence those decisions very early on. Yeah, and what best way to uh, introduce a researcher that would later work on such production than to help them when they don't even have something that you can play with, right? Uh, I think it's important because it's also, uh, I mean, uh, it, it also means how important, and that might be, uh, we can develop on that on another talk, but how important it is to uh, also learn from our research, not, not just only delivering uh, what the production needs at a certain point, but, you know, um, uh, like um, aggregating our research and saying, okay, what do we know about these topics and these topics, etc.? because if we can really have developed this uh, uh, broader expertise that is research-based and that uh, it can contribute to very early be uh, meaningful and insightful to uh, production teams, I think it's a very nice way to start building that collaboration. 100%. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, I think we talked about it in the communication episode, like doing less research. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's really thinking meaningfully, you know, if you're, if you've got a team that's really early on thinking about research, even that you've done or other games have done, you know, there are ways of coming in and really showing where your value is and what you can add to the team and becoming that, you know, becoming blended by being able to help kind of provide information and just being that kind of empathetic support for the team. Yep, absolutely. So uh, we're getting running. We're running to the end of time. So I'm gonna yeah, gonna that's why because I was say, we could discuss <laughs> other example, but I was watching time. Ah, not sure. Maybe another time. <laughs> we'll have to get back to those other examples at another time. So if people are really interested, um, drop us a line. Let us know. I think we could probably chat about that for many, many days. But I think. I want to get kind of your your final your final takeaways. You know, so what are some of the most important steps towards moving towards a a blended relationship with our design teams? Don't rush into the testing room. Try to understand your context first. I think that's great. <laughs> that was like much shorter than I was expecting. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's good. I think uh, it's. Yeah, it's, it's really taking the time to understand. You know, I've said this so many times, I think many times in the podcast, my team is probably very sick of me saying it. It's just take time to listen, you know, stay curious, understand what they're going through, what questions they have. It's not all about, it's not always about coming in and providing answers and giving the information. It's just as important to be able to come in and be able to help ask the right questions to facilitate that conversation. It's thinking about supporting consistently, having that consistency with your presence, the consistency of what you're able to kind of be a part of these conversations. And again, like you were saying, it's not rushing into the test room. It's not focusing only on these all encompassing tests that are really big. They really can contribute to that anxiety when expectations are not managed well. And yeah, not focusing solely on just getting in that test room as quickly as possible. Think about other ways of, you know, research reviews, um, competitive analysis, or just even past research that has been done or being able to run internal studies, play sessions, anything like that. And I think one of the most important things that I always tell for my team is acting as a facilitator of the discussion, not just thinking about yourself as I'm here presenting a piece of research. It's really about facilitating a conversation and how that can really help to lead you to the point where you're able to be a part of that decision making process. Yeah, and uh, when it comes to, 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 to reporting, I mean, uh, if you have the chance to organize some workshops and to facilitate those workshops, uh, that, that, that's a great way because, of course, we need to be before to understand what the needs are, but we need to be thereafter to see how they make the decisions because otherwise we fall into the uh, iteration black box thing. But uh, yes. doing the workshop is basically building the table to which you want to be present. So uh, that's a great way of being part of those uh, decision-making discussions. I think that that was the perfect way to end this. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. It's always it's always nice to to have the time to to sit and chat with these things. I think it's really interesting and it's it's always helpful to reflect on kind of how our team has grown and, you know, kind of how we can 
continue to to build off of some of the really good things that we've discovered that work really well for our teams and sharing those with others. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I hope we had, I wish we had more time, but that's right. So <laughs> I'll, I'll see you uh, next time. Thanks, I'll <laughs> see you next time. Bye, Laini. Thank you. Our community of games user experience professionals with our Discord and Twitter, and subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content, including Grox Online attendee offers from sponsors Sketch and Balsamic. Check out the link below.
Prox Online is sponsored by Player Research. Player Research is the premier games user research partner, enabling game dev to gain meaningful insight from real players across the world. Delivering actionable insights on usability, UX, appeal, and play so that you can focus on the game. Playtest Cloud is your destination for modern and effortless mobile usability and playtesting. Over 300 studios test their games with our panel of over 1 million players. These players help you discover why players play, how they play. Crux Online is sponsored by Balsamic. Balsamic Wireframes is the industry standard for rapid, low-fidelity wireframing. It combines the comfort and simplicity of paper sketching with the power of a digital tool so your work is easier to share, modify, and get honest feedback on. Hello, my name is Deborah Henderson. I am a principal user researcher with Xbox, and I am here to talk about developing the skills of your UR team, or at least how I tend to think about it. Now, when thinking about development, I think the first and most basic question you have to ask is, what do you want to train, right? What are the skills you are trying to develop? And for me, they come in sort of four flavors. However, each of these flavors has something in common. They are not necessarily knowledge bases or tactical things or anything like that. Rather, what they are is lenses with which a UR can view a problem, right? So I think about research as a lens. When I see a problem, I look at it through a research lens and I think, what is the right method to get the answer to this question? Similarly, I think URs need to know about games, not just how to play them or experience them, but also to develop into understanding how you design them and think about them from a development perspective. That is another lens to apply towards any problem that comes to a UR. A third lens for looking at a problem is production. I have a problem, I know it's there, I know it would be good for gamers, I know how a designer would solve it, but when do I ask to get the in the sort of solution implemented. That's a separate problem. That's a production problem, right? Understanding when people can do what, that's its own ball of wax. It's its own way to look at a problem and its own, its own way to look at a solution. And finally, the fourth lens that I think that it's important to develop in URs is a systemic lens. And here I mean to just recognize the URL part of a system. So I belong to Xbox Research. Our group belongs to Xbox, Xbox belongs to Microsoft, Microsoft lives in the United States, the United States lives in the world. These are systems within systems within systems. And what's interesting about systems is that as there can be sort of forces and pressures from outside systems that come along and sweep you up. We are all sort of flots of jetsam at some point in these great big systems. As an example, GDPR is a system that I suspect uh, has swept a number of you along, right? You had to change your behavior because somewhere in England, a law was implemented and suddenly this had ripple effects. 
These are the four lenses that I think are really key to be developed in a UR. But at the same time, I do want to acknowledge one that is missing, right? I show this, these as like, these are the key th skills that I think you need to develop. And normally a reaction is, um, but what about soft skills? And soft skills are important. You need to be able to persuade people. But for me, I find them interrelated to these knowledge bases. So I tend to think of them more like this. When I'm good at research, I can use research to persuade people. When I understand how a designer thinks about a design problem or a game, I understand how to persuade them, similar with production and system. It's not that the skills themselves are necessarily different, right? I am always building an empathy bridge, trying to understand the needs and wants of the person I'm persuading, and then tailoring my message to them so they can better understand me. What changes is that I have a better understanding of their perspective because I have grown to have different ways to look at the same problem. So if this is what you are trying to develop, and it's certainly what I try to develop in URs that I'm mentoring, I think the next question is, who are you training? I think this is a tempting question to skip over, right? I'm, I'm training my directs. I'm training the people I mentor. I'm training the people who are somehow looking up to me in some way. And that's absolutely true. You're definitely going to be wanting to train an individual. But I think there's another entity to acknowledge. I think that you need to think about both the needs of the individual you are training, but also the needs of the organization, which to be clear, you are also training, right? The organization is going to be providing training for the individual, but I'm going to argue that the individual can also provide training and development for the organization all up. Now, it's worth thinking about both of these perspectives because, of course, their needs are very different. The individual is a snowflake. They are a unique individual, right? They need instruction that is tailored to their strengths and weaknesses. And yet, when I look at the organization's need, the point of developing URs is not to heighten their individuality necessarily, although that certainly comes out of it sometimes. Rather, the goal of an organization is really to establish a consistent quality bar and a set of replicable processes independent of specific researchers. Because, of course, researchers leave. And if your entire knowledge base is tied up in an individual, then that knowledge leaves with them. The organization needs to be resilient. The organization needs to see individuals not as snowflakes, but rather as just another board in Theseus's ship. So it's easy to see these two perspectives as being deeply conflicting. But what I'm going to argue, and the point of this talk really, is to say that I think you can take these two perspectives and tie them into a singular en engine that benefits both the individual and the organization. Here's how. So we begin with the individual. And they know some stuff, but they do not all the, know all the stuff. Fortunately, there's an organization. And this organization can provide institutional knowledge and process. Let's take a moment and talk about how we do that. So I'll be honest and say we take, again, this kind of split perspective. It, it carries through in the way that the organization tends to train people. So first off, the organization just documents a lot of stuff. This is our one-on-one -on -one page. This is what we would expect when you are first hired in as a baby UR, a UR1. You come in and we say, great, here is an absolute boatload of information that we have collected over time and we have tried to make as approachable for new stakeholders as possible, right? At the same time, it is worth not acknowledging that this covers these sort of four lenses that I'm talking about. For one thing, we add Xbox Game Pass to it. In the past, we would just uh, give people access to a library of games. But we teach things that are about our own system, so how Xbox research works. We also teach them things about the Microsoft system all up. We also teach them about the methods that are specific to games user research. We teach a little bit about soft skills, though not that much. And we teach a fair bit about production, like how does production work and how does UR fit into it? At the same time, um, it is worth noting that these are things that haven't necessarily been built originally for games user researchers. So I'm going to give you a specific example. 
is a lovely sort of one pager explaining the difference between playtest and usability, right? This is incredibly useful for handing to teams because you go through and you say, yes, 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 I know you're asking for a playtest. The way that we use the word playtest is very specific with an Xbox research. Here's how we use it. Um, and really what this is nice for is really training teams to understand that it's the nature of the question that matters to them. It is also, however, very useful when training individual URs, right? You can go through and say, look, this is the thing you need to start practicing explaining to your teams from a soft skills perspective, but also you need to understand the difference in this as a researcher, right? You need to understand the kinds of questions that you can answer with one method versus another. Now, we don't just throw this documentation at people. Instead, we pair it with individual trainings. So for the individual, we give them typically manager or mentor support, right? We say, go off, read this, and I want to come back and have an hour long meeting with you. And we're, ch we're just going to talk about the reading. What questions did you have? What made sense to you? What didn't make sense to you? That sort of thing. And that's a way to give the individual both the default baseline understanding of what we mean by methods, but also just tailor it to them so that their unique expectations and assumptions are addressed and either amplified and celebrated or maybe corrected. Right. The other thing we do is we tend to train um, very practically so that when people are doing their first usability or their first play test, we will give feedback on every single individual step of the process. It is very, very detailed. Um, generally speaking, this takes twice as long as somebody who is fully trained to go through the whole process. Um, but part of why we do this is just because observation and feedback is really important when mastering qualitative methods, right? It is hard to tell people in the abstract that you should give someone space in an interview and allow the silence to become awkward, which is true, but at the same point, it's hard to sort of catch that moment and to recognize it when it's happening. And you need somebody who's just a little bit more experienced with you to observe you and give you feedback. So we pair it with practical training and we believe in the practical training to such an extent that even the most senior among us have our reports reviewed, right? So um, my manager is Randy, he is the director of the entire organization. He nonetheless has to read through every single usability report that I do because it is important that I get his feedback and I understand um, when, and I'm just challenged, I guess is what I would say. I understand his perspective, but also that I'm challenged on my conclusions and we ensure that they're really the best quality research that I could be doing. The other way that we acknowledge the individual, and this is a little bit of a new thing for us now, but we're starting within our documentation to actually split um, the document apart a little bit. So an example of this comes from our usability training. We have two documents. One is practical, one is more theoretical. This is because we've started to see that within our own group there are two personas that we need to foster. One is people who are focused on why. Why am I doing it this way? Another is people who are focused on how. Just tell me how I'm doing it. I'll be honest and say I think most URs come in on the why side of things. It's particularly unnerving for people who have a quantitative background to be asked to do qualitative research without them understanding some of the theory behind it. And then as URs just get more trust in our training and get more trust in the URs around the each, them and get more sort of practical skills, they tend to focus a little bit more on just how, how am I supposed to execute this? So we try to support this both in our documentation. I will say this is the point in the conversation where I do want to acknowledge that keeping up documentation is challenging. It is definitely difficult. It is absolutely, however, a priority. And the reason I think it is a priority is because by building this documentation that initially helps individuals, in the end, what you're helping really is your organization all up. So this is a priority, not necessarily for the individual, but rather for the organization. Because of course, once the institution provides knowledge and process, the individual gets to master these techniques. And that's when they start to innovate. And this is so valuable to an organization. At the same time, I will say that our philosophy is pretty strict on this. You're not allowed to jump into innovation. You really got to kind of master the basics. And by basics, I mean the full UR tool set before you're allowed to innovate. And the reason for this is pretty simple. The basic answer is that if you are a master of a singular method, then you are a hammer and everything is a nail. That's not good. So we try to get people to master the sort of full tool suite before allowing them to innovate.
The other thing that I will say that this unlocks, because we have institutional knowledge and we expect to be able to provide this sort of training for people, is it changes the way that we hire. So I've talked in the past uh, in the Discord at times, and this has sort of puzzled people when I've talked about it, about how sometimes it's better for people to know less about games user research than um, knowing more, right? If you know more, if you're just like a really great researcher, but you've never had any experience there in terms of actually doing user research, sometimes this can be an advantage when interviewing with us. And in part, that's because of some of the assumptions we make, right? Because we have the institutional knowledge and process, we can hire PhDs. And what's interesting about PhDs is for the most part, they have no idea what games user research is about. They are slightly bemused to discover this field even exists, right? They might have read some papers, but normally when they start talking about those papers, they kind of flirt with disaster because they don't really understand the implications of the papers because they just haven't done the hands-on training, right? But the reason we hire PhDs, who for the record probably know less stuff than people who have actually been trained in how to do a usability, is because we expect it to pay off later, specifically once we've trained people and they start to innovate, right? I'm an example of this. So they hired me. I had no idea what a usability was. I thought it was a relatively dubious method when I first started. It was deeply sketchy to me. And then I got experience with it and I became a convert, right? And I thought about how usability mapped onto narrative. And that's where I started to innovate. And what was important is I wasn't just innovating by myself. Instead, once innovation starts, the organization has a sort of need to institutionalize this innovation at scale because, of course, methods and process must replicate, right? A method is only a method if multiple URs can do it across multiple process, products. Otherwise, it's just sort of a kind of strange thing that an individual does. Maybe insightful, maybe nuanced for the product, but it's not actually a method or a process. And this this transition is a little frustrating for people. And the reason it's frustrating and hard for people is because you're essentially taking somebody who is at maximum snowflake, right? They have gone through the training, they've been given the opportunity to innovate, they've really brought their own special sauce to the moment. And you say, that's amazing, but for this to count, you have to make yourself irrelevant. You gotta get on the boat. You gotta turn yourself from a snow <laughs> snowflake into just one of Theseus's planks. Right. And this is really sort of emotionally exhausting, I think, and it brings on sort of the system sulk. So when we look at the sort of first growth curve that we we're looking at, sort of UR1 to UR2, this is how it normally plays out for us. It's not universal, but this is sort of typical. It tends to be sort of more like modeling RPG growth, right, which is a lot of fun because you go out, you get a mission, do a usability, you go out, you do it, you earn some experience, you level up. It's amazing, right? You go out, you get another mission, do a play test, go out, do that, execute it beautifully, do a second one by yourself. Oh man, ding, ding, you're leveling up. It's great. By contrast, this kind of transition where you have to stop are no longer taught sort of standard things and instead are asked to innovate and then take it to scale. That's hard. It's hard both because of the skill mastery shift, right, which is challenging, but also because you have to learn to remove yourself from your innovation. It really requires a certain level of what I'm referring to as systems understanding. You have to understand how to take a method and move it outside of yourself so it works within your organization. Fortunately, there are ways to sort of baby step people through this. So of course, the first thing with any form of training is that your organization has to message to the individual that you are looking for this behavior, that you expect this behavior, that you value this behavior. And then the second and perhaps more difficult thing is that you have to convince people that you can consistently judge whether or not they're doing a good job with this sort of behavior. I will tell you, um, I think this is a challenge. I think there are different ways that this can express, but for me, this tends to be a typical progression skill, a sort of path that individuals take when they're leveling up their systems understanding. So first off, when you ask somebody, hey, like it's great that you did a method or you've thought through a problem set or you've developed a process, but do you think you could maybe sort of document this in some way so that other people could take advantage of it? Typically their first reaction is to just sort of write literally everything down and be like, good luck. I mean, here are all your choices. Good luck with that. A more sophisticated approach to that is perhaps to say, hey, here are all your options, but also here's a framework to kind of help you work your way through your options so you make good decisions. 
an even more sophisticated approach would be somebody who says, hey, I'm actually going to give you a default recommendation. And here's why you should just assume that you're doing this. Here are the ways in which you might need to adjust it. But like, generally speaking, this is a really good solid approach. And this is lovely because it really offloads a lot of the responsibility from the person who's learning it the next time onto the person who is nominally the expert. That being said, it is a much, much, much more difficult thing to do because of course, you can't just declare by fiat that something is the default. You need to get buy-in from everybody who might have an opinion. And that is really where the work of systems design oftentimes come in, like making sure that all of the needs are understood and the alignment is very clear so your organization as a whole can have a perspective. And then finally, I think the most sophisticated way that people do this is they don't just have a sort of systems understanding of the piece that they are adding, but they also understand how it fully integrates into all of the pre-existing processes and pipelines, right? They're not trying to take over the world with the piece that they're adding, rather they're trying to add a sort of complementary element to everything that already exists. The real trick to this engine is that it's not about one individual, it's about many individuals, right? An organization isn't simply a person, it's a group of people. And so really it's about most individuals who know some stuff, but not all the stuff. And what an organization needs to do is make sure that everybody's benefiting from the stuff other people know, right? So here is an example of that. This is our 201 page. This is the page that we sort of throw probably more you are too is that people kind of opt into it based on what they need at a given moment. And what's interesting about this page is that every single method that we're sort of talking about here has lots of examples, it has lots of method things, it has sort of demonstrations of it in use, but it also has an expert that you should go and talk to because not everybody knows everything, right? And you got to be able to leverage that as an organization and you got to be able to document that knowledge and you want to get more people to be that expertise. So if one person leaves, other people are still there. But the basic idea is that like an org should be leveling up individuals as long as those individuals are also leveling up the org. I think these things are really symbiotic, even if they are tradi traditionally very, very hard to get individuals to do. But the key here is really to think of it as a progression loop, right? There's a sort of chestnut in game development, which is this idea that if players aren't growing, they're quitting. And I think really this is why it's important at its heart to develop individuals because it's fun to learn. It is hard, I think, to teach others, but it is fun to learn. And the organization also should view this as a progression loop because they also should be getting better. It's just, again, the perspectives here are a little different, right? The individual wants to grow as an individual and be rewarded for their growth. Fair enough, that's totally legitimate. The institution, at least if you're anything like ours, wants to become a respected institution, no longer scrabbling and defending its existence, right? Well, at the same time, it wants to stay at the forefront of its field, right? It's not okay to ossify your knowledge and fall behind where others are leaping ahead. And it's worth remembering that this is a way to think about just sort of progression all up in your org, right? So for us, we have a lot of people. We are a relatively large org and we have a fair differentiation here, right? I am at the principal level. This is a little bit atypical for individual URs, but it is worth noting I started at the bottom and I earned my way up. Part of why it's a little atypical is that in fact, our principal band is actually dominated by management. And for me, this progression loop was key for me to sort of level up as a UR and for, to be developed. It's one of the reasons why I think it is a useful way to think about UR development because it worked for me. So I will tell you my personal story. Now, remember, these are the four lenses that I think everybody needs to be developed in. And here's how it worked for me. As a UR1, I was hired in and I knew a lot about research because I had a PhD and I knew something about games because I really loved playing them. As a UR2, I knew more about research because of course I was trained. I learned about the wonders of usability and I got to do play tests. I also learned more about games. I spent hours at some point talking with a designer about animation systems, just understanding how they work, right? It really changed the way I saw games. But the other thing is I started to actually ship games and lists let me know a little bit about production and to understand the production life cycle and the health there. As a senior UR, 
I'm going to say I began to get into system thinking, right, and the, to sort of see the systems that are there. I'll be honest and say I think that I wasn't particularly great at this, but at least I acknowledged their existence. Part of this is because I was given very specific um, sort of within XR projects to help me grow this and help me understand like, hey, here's how the tools team works. And here's the breadth of URs that you need to think about when you're supporting things. And here is all of the ways that we differentiate the kind of skill sets that people have. Think about us as a system, not as sort of just a place where an individual can shine. As a principal you are, I would say that, again, I'm pretty good on research, you know, but I wouldn't say I've mastered it. Like there are things that are on the 201 page that I haven't done, right? I haven't really gotten into a lot of the translation work and the international work that we're doing. I have a lot of experience with games and with watching designers solve things, but more importantly, perhaps I have a deeper understanding of production. Like I have a much better understanding of the way producers think, which allows me to negotiate like, hey, can I get a head count here? Because I think this part of the game is weak. That's really valuable for me. Right. It allows me to have impact because it means that I ensure that I have the right manpower on the systems within the game that my research is telling me need to be amplified. And finally, the other thing that I would say is that I've got like at least a baseline understanding of the systems. Probably I would say more the systems within Xbox research than externally. This is in part because I've again been put in charge of things like this, right? So we had a product project that we codenamed Mogwai. It was about us transitioning to Survey Gizmo. That was why it was called Mogwai. And me just thinking through all of the ways the act of shifting a survey tool impacted everyone in XR. This made me, it forced me, let's be clear, to see the systems in place. This is an education that I value because it helps me understand where I need to put inflection points for URs and where I need to ask for things to make not just myself, but others better. I think when you look at these sort of four areas, there's a question as well of like, is this a min-max system or is this something where you can sort of cap out on all of them? So. If you were to ask me just directly, can you max out on all of these? I would probably say no. And the reason is because I've watched people who I deeply, deeply respect far outpace me in certain areas. These are the managers. So if you remember, this is how I scored myself. Um, I have looked at the managers around me and I didn't actually inquire what, the way that they would score themselves so they may disagree with this entirely. I will admit that this is my perspective but the way that I would score them looks a little bit more like this. Now yes I kept all the numbers consistent but the main thing to notice here is that I knocked them back on a couple of things that are really core for me, right? I knocked them back on research and games. I knocked them back on that because it's been years for many of them when they actually did it. They understand the principles, they understand the basics, but honestly, that whole switch of survey tool, that means they have zero mastery of our current survey tool because they're, they grew up with the old survey tool, right? At the same time, they are so much better at system thinking than I am, right? It is something where anybody who has lived through the Microsoft HR system simply has to be good at mastering and understanding systems, right? When managers are first hired in Microsoft, they are given 40 hours of training. <laughs> and this is in part so they can be a healthy and natural part of the system. I'll be honest and say I am deeply, deeply grateful that I don't need to master systems nearly this much. And I hope that they are also equally grateful that there are people around them who outpace them in research. And I say this with a certain degree of confidence, because if I were to go back to that 201 page where we've put all the names on, there's really only one person here who's a manager. Everybody else who's listed, they're individual contributors, they're ICs, they are like me, they are researchers, they're not management. And the reason this manager is here is of course because her PhD required her to know how to do re like interviews in a spectacular and beautiful way. And she has led the charge on forcing the rest of us to become better at it. And hopefully we'll have people who come in and can take this place from her and sort of carry this burden for her. Um, in part because it would be great to free her up, but also because I think when we think about this kind of loop overall, it's important to recognize that 
systems, when you when you lead a system by innovating in a method because you've mastered it because an organization has taught you that, but you've also brought your own perspective, and then you've actually done the work to institutionalize this knowledge and share it with others, that's a kind of leadership. And that's something that I think a lot of teams really struggle to recognize and celebrate, right? There's a lot of talk within tech about the difference between management and IC. And this is one of the few paths where I've seen that people can actually be on par with management without having to sort of, I don't know, secretly be a manager but not be called a manager. Let me put it that way. So for me, I think it's a fascinating path to think about in terms of up-leveling up -leveling both your individuals into becoming leaders, but also because of their leadership, leveling up your organization as a whole. So in sum, if I were to make recommendations, it is this, look internally to grow. If you have a group of people, they can make each other smarter. Document organizational knowledge. This is a priority at an organization level, even if it's not at an individual level. Build progression systems. Don't just collect smart individuals. They will leave, they win the lottery, they'll go off and get married, they'll run away, right? Reward difficulty of going to scale because it is so difficult and it, it is so vital to your organization. And then don't conflate expertise and leadership, right? I think that the managers in our org are absolute leaders, but it's not because they're experts across the board. It's because they're experts in certain areas and they pull and make the rest of us better. Think about leadership in that frame, or at least that's what I would do. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, comments, objections, concerns, please feel free to drop them into the Discord. I will absolutely look forward to reading them and responding to them there. Bye-bye. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.
open our community of games user experience professionals with our Discord and Twitter. And subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content, including Grox Online attendee offers from sponsors Sketch and Balsamic. Check out the link below. Hi, I'm Elise. I'm the user research specialist at Remedy, and today I'll be talking about building a user research process. This is something that will look completely different depending on a lot of different things, whether it's the size of the studio, the company culture, um, the size of the user research team, whether it's embedded or a centralized team. Uh, all of that will make for a different process. Uh, so here I'll take a look at the specific case of Remedy, a mid-site studio, multi-projects, working on AAA games with one researcher. Before I started, there was no user researcher and no UR department. So this will be a, a look at how step by step this user research process was built. Uh, I'm also not going to take a look at this from a very high level point of view. I won't be describing pipelines and long term plans on how to do user research at different stages of production. This is a more granular view of a user research process, how to start organizing research. Uh, and instead of highlighting all the things that were great and presenting the successes of developing the user research at the studio, uh, instead I will go through everything that went wrong um, and what I learned from failing. So a little bit of context. Um, at Remedy, we work on a lot of different games. Uh, we recently released Alan Wake Remastered and two years ago we released Control. We're still working on different projects that are different points of development uh, with different publishing partners. Some are multiplayer, some are single player, some third person, some first. So we're working currently on a lot of different games. So when I started in October 2018, there was no UR before. Uh, and there were several projects ongoing at the time. Control was getting closer to release. It was in late development. And there were a couple of other projects in development as well. Uh, and also different kinds of games at different stages of development. And, and when I started, I did start creating those pipelines and looking at the high level view of how research should be done. Uh, but research was really needed right now, especially on control, as it was not too far away from release. And my main goal was to get things rolling, start getting a process in place so that I could provide research for the teams. Um, so that, so what was there when I started? Um, I didn't start from scratch. And there was already a lot of interest uh, at Remedy in gathering player feedback. Uh, different teams were already doing some things here and there to get the players involved and learn from players' experience with the games. Uh, that means that I didn't have to fight very hard for buy-in when I started, as there was always already a, a certain level of interest. Uh, and that made my job much easier when I started because they were eager to start building this and incorporate it in their development pipelines. Um, they were eager to get players in as soon as possible. So what was happening before I started? Um, different disciplines were already doing some very interesting things uh, and gathering player feedback in different ways. Um, the process was already very collaborative. Um, QA was involved. There was some interested devs in as well. Um, the UX designer was part of the process. Um, and some producers were also helping up setting up uh, this process. Um, they were all working together and launching different uh, user research initiatives. Um, different on each of the projects, so they uh, so they had uh, already set up research in some form or another. Um, 
one of the projects uh, on one of the projects they were inviting already some external players to play parts of the game um, this would happen occasionally throughout development um, and they would re recruit players through friends family uh, sometimes social media uh, and players would come in uh, and they would be set up in a temporary lab that would typically be a meeting room the devs would sit behind the players and observe them play uh, and then they had a conversation all together or a survey they could fill in uh, and then the raw data was, sh was shared with the teams. Uh, there was not so much in terms of analysis or report writing, uh, but there was already something done uh, to share the data with the wider team. On another project, there was uh, some internal research that was being done with internal players. Um, they were organizing company-wide playtests. Um, this was also a collaborative uh, a process where producers, QA, designers uh, would be involved in organizing this. Um, instructions were sent to everyone at the company and uh, anyone that wants to participate could join in from their desk um, and there was a, su a survey available uh, to fill in to share your feedback uh, but most also shared feedback on public channels with the wider team and then the raw data was also shared similar to the previous one but here again there was no consistent analysis or ways of writing reports uh, but they were already finding ways of gathering data and sharing that feedback with the with the game team uh, when I started, I spent some time talking to everyone interested and involved in the process that was already in place. Uh, the goal was to understand what they were doing and what their goals were with the process, uh, what they were trying to get out of it, uh, and also what their struggles were with the process. What are the pain points uh, with it? Uh, so I, pen, I spent a long while listening to those involved in the process and interested in what doing and what doing research could bring. Uh, I also read through surveys, uh, through the reports that were being shared, to the instructions given to player. Um, I didn't want to start by erasing all the past work and efforts. So when I took uh, over the UR at Remedy, um, I simply started by taking over what they were doing and started finding very practical ways of improving their setup and building on top of what they had previously done. Uh, formalizing what they were doing, writing documentation on best practices, uh, methods and tools. Um, doing this was useful for uh, several reasons. Uh, because I was simply taking over what was being done, it wasn't a huge change in their workflows and it made it easy to build trust and relationships. Uh, it also meant uh, I already had an in with those that um, were previously organizing this research. Um, it was also useful in terms of tools and understanding how things work at the studio, how information flows uh, and how the different crafts and de departments work together. Um, those that were involved in this before I started were also my first allies. Um, the ones I then needed to build a more formalized research process. So I had the needed points of contact, more knowledge on the studio's inner workings uh, and an uh, easy in, in already in their workflows. And I then started pinpointing what I believed was missing in this basic setup. Uh, I started with the lab itself, building a permanent research lab, looking into what is the ideal lab setup, how can we fit that to what was possible at Remedy, um, also what will this lab be used for long term and making sure it has everything we need to do proper research with external players. Um, I also started on the recruitment process. Um, as I said, they were recruiting through friends and family. There wasn't really anything more than that. Uh, so I started with a survey and looking into ways to get a steady stream of playtesters that would be available when we needed it. Um, and I was also looking at the, the tools we could use uh, for live streaming tests, uh, for surveys, for transcribing interviews, um, to help as well analyze the data and so on. Uh, and then when getting uh, external players in, there is all this legal and ethical aspect to it. So I spent some time creating the needed consent forms and pushed for proper incentives uh, to compensate player participation. And then uh, with this in place, the tools, the lab, the recruitment um, and the existing process, uh, it was easy to then start building on top of that and starting to pr propose other method methods and more extensive research projects. So I was doing this fairly soon after starting uh, and projects were ongoing and for control not so far from release. So things needed to pick up quite quickly. Um, although I had created those uh, high level plans and pipelines, I was uh, much more focused on what are the needs now? Uh, what do the game teams need in terms of research right now? Um, and the main goal was to get insights and player feedback now to, now to help the teams with the ongoing projects. 
by, by taking this approach, I was aiming to show the teams the benefits of doing research, um, and I was trying to offer as much research um, as possible uh, and share insights quickly and very regularly. Uh, this was a way to get the teams used to research, to get them into a research rhythm uh, and exposing them to different methods and workflows involved in research uh, and start being part of the conversation. So how research was scheduled uh, was based on demand. So I received requests from designers and I would start planning from there. Um, this is something I am currently still working on, finding ways to implement those high level pipelines and better plan research ahead of time. Uh, but at the time, that's how we were doing it. Um, so once research was scheduled, the process was fairly simple and basic. Um, it was also meant to be quick as we were doing a lot of research on a couple of different projects. Um, I had sometimes uh, two tests scheduled in the same week. Um, so the process was designed to allow me to move from one research project to the next quickly. Um, and the first step was gathering information. Uh, what are we testing? Who do we test with? Uh, what feedback are we gathering? And I was doing that by pinging people on Slack or standing at their desk. Uh, I took all of that information I got and crafted a test, found some players and started organizing this. Uh, it wasn't documented much. I wasn't sharing research briefs. It was a simple, uh, communicated and flexible research. The test itself was live streamed, but without much thought behind it, uh, I started streaming and shared the links with the research, with the game teams. Uh, and after that, there was an analysis and a report. Uh, the report was then shared on Slack with everyone on the project team, um, and there was, um, and then that's where the research ended uh, and moved on to the next uh, research that needed to be done. Uh, and I did that for a while, um, and I learned a lot from doing that. And this basic, simple process um, had some issues. So the first and main issue was that user research was not necessarily part of development. Um, at least not fully part of the development processes. Uh, research is a shared service, uh, and I was organizing for several research for several projects, um, and I wasn't embedded in any of them. Um, as I showed in the in the process I presented earlier, uh, after a test was scheduled, um, a week before the test, I would start gathering information. Uh, but I wouldn't do much before that to understand the intended design of the feature or mission we would test. Uh, I would gather the ba ba basic and absolutely necessary information, like how long would they need to play or what mission are they playing, what topics of feedback are they interested in. Uh, but I didn't spend time getting a deep understanding of the game uh, and the intent behind uh, um, the experience. And that meant that often uh, the intended design was a bit obscure to me. Uh, when testing combat, for example, I didn't necessarily know um, in what context they expected a certain weapon or ability to be used, or what the difficulty level of a boss fight was meant to be, or how they intended players to navigate a certain level, um, there was knowledge missing on my part. Um, the consequence of that is that I often shared insights uh, where I was told this is intended, or I potentially missed a lot of issues uh, because I didn't have that deep knowledge of the game they were trying to build. Um, it's hard to know if players are experiencing things like they are meant to be experienced, Seeing them uh, if you don't know what it is. Um, knowing the game, uh, knowing the game well, uh, is something I learned from that early process. Uh, working on demand and not being fully part of the development process also meant the research was, wasn't fully in sync uh, with the game project milestones and sprints. Um, I didn't really know what they were working on at the time of the test. Uh, what are the milestone goals and priorities that the test could help with? Uh, what are the features that need special attention? Um, and this led to some insights, um, some insights to not necessarily be relevant to their current goals. Um, so without a good knowledge of the game and the game production, uh, insights were not always as meaningful, relevant and valuable uh, as they could have been. Um, so at the time, um, I was also working in isolation. Um, although I was gathering information, a lot of the process was me doing my thing without much collaboration. Um, and this was mostly an issue with QA. Uh, I was involving QA in the process, uh, but not enough. Um, I would get a build without really knowing what could go wrong or what was the state of certain features or if there were any blockers. Um, I would play the game myself before the test, but I didn't have the time or the knowledge to do this thoroughly enough. 
Um, so during tests, uh, what players would experience could be a bit of a surprise. Um, the feature we were testing might be missing, or players could um, lose their weapons or get stuck in the geometry, uh, and I couldn't do much about it. Um, and that is definitely something I've been, I spent uh, quite some time working on since. The other main problem was uh, assessing how useful the research was. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, the research ended when the report was shared on Slack, uh, and that was it. Uh, nothing happened on my side after that. I had no way of, of tracking how useful the research was to the team. Um, I assumed it was somewhat useful um, as research kept being requested, but that's all I knew. I didn't know if the teams were discussing the research, uh, if they would work on a feature we tested, and if the reports were being read by the team. So not knowing whether the research is useful or not uh, makes it harder to get buy-in, uh, to show the value of doing research, to prove to leadership that this is something worth doing. Uh, and it also makes it um, harder to improve on the process. If I don't know whether the insights are relevant uh, and valuable, I can't iterate on my process uh, and make changes to ensure that the research is helping the teams make design decisions. Um, those issues might seem obvious to some of you, uh, something that I should have known would happen when setting up the process in this way. Um, but I was doing a lot of research at the time, trying to cover as much of the content as I could in short periods of time, um, and especially for the projects closer to release. Uh, and I wasn't doing a lot of reflexive work, uh, looking at what was working well, at what wasn't working well. Uh, I was stuck in the grind and stuck with this process uh, for a while. Uh, and although the issues with being out of sync with the teams and the game were becoming apparent, um, I didn't start fixing, fixing uh, this process until after Control was released. So when uh, I actually took the time to look back and talk with designers and QA and producers, um, looking at what was done, what didn't work well and what did, um, I could start looking into what I can do about it, uh, what could be improved. Um, so the main issue was um, lacking knowledge and being out of sync with the teams and the game intent itself. So what I did to work on that part, uh, I started by getting a lot more involved with the teams and what they were doing. Um, the research doesn't start when a request comes in and I start planning, it is ongoing. Uh, and, gather, and gathering knowledge is something that never stops. Uh, the game and the scope changes, evolves, uh, the features are iterate, iterated on. Um, and so being part of the conversation starts by just being there, uh, being present, uh, joining the conversation. Uh, sitting in on design meetings, on build reviews where designers play through missions and talk through the intent. Uh, building relationships with producers uh, to understand what the teams uh, are working towards, um, what are the current pain points and worries, uh, and just stick around to understand how the design intent changes uh, and to continue building that in-depth knowledge of the game. Um, and that takes a lot of time. It's time consuming to be present. Um, I now spend a lot more time understanding the game and what the designers are trying to achieve. Uh, and that sometimes means doing less research, but making sure that the research we do is meaningful. Uh, there's no point in um, doing test after test after test if we cannot get as much valuable insights out of doing those tests. Um, this also helps uh, organizing and crafting the research. Uh, having that in-depth knowledge makes it easier to understand what to observe and what kind of feedback would be helpful for the teams. Um, one of the other problems uh, I pointed out earlier was the lack of uh, process involving the QA. Uh, so we now have a, a process in place that we have iterated on. Um, there is a, a process on QA site that takes uh, user research into account uh, and builds um, our, the builds needed for research are now QA tested with research goals in mind. Um, there is also a specific QA points of contact for each uh, of the projects. Uh, and that point of contact provides uh, a build with build notes uh, that involves workarounds of all the possible issues that could occur during a test. Um, QA also watches the live streams uh, on the day of the test to ensure everything runs smoothly and they, uh, and they also provide support if the players experience something unexpected. Um, and this has made running tests a much smoother process. Um, the other problem was not being able to track the impact of doing re user research. Um, and my initial process uh, stopped the moment the report was shared. So I spent some time working on the after. 
I also started uh, sharing reports in a way that involved a lot more summaries and bite-sized information to make it easier to pick out information. Um, I, I've also started doing test reviews after each test, uh, which is just a meeting where I present the main results and include clips of the test, uh, and we discuss the insights, what was useful, what wasn't, uh, what were they aware of, and what was a surprise to them, uh, what can be fixed and what can't, um, and we also discuss um, what insights could be turned into JIRA tickets. Uh, this is not the same for every project and depends on what tools the team uh, is using to track progress. Um, on one of the ongoing projects is JIRA. Uh, the goal is to track the player experience insights uh, and understand how that evolves during development. It's much easier to find an issue from a test six months ago in a JIRA than to find it in a dense, lengthy report. Uh, this is helpful to track what happens to, um, to an issue as designers can comment on what the intent was and explain if it's uh, progressing and mark the issue as fixed as well. So with you using the tools that the team is currently using themselves, uh, it makes it easier to be part of the conversation and gives the research more visibility. Um, the issue can be discussed, it can be shared, uh, it can be referred back to. Um, uh, if the same issue is occurring six months la later, we can easily retrace back to the last time it was tested. Uh, and in the process, there is now a lot more thought as well put in back into iterating. Um, and making sure we test features more than once. Um, once a feature has gone through some changes, we try to test it again um, and assess if issues are still occurring. Uh, this is, of course, uh, made easier when the research is part of the development process very early on. Uh, on Control, for example, we start doing research not long before release, and as there was not so much content and um, not much opportunity to retest the content um, and assess how things were processing, this is something that has been much more part of the process now. And as you see, this process uh, is expanding, has changed, uh, and it's something that is still ongoing and moving uh, and not set in stone. Um, with each project, uh, we learn what works and what doesn't, um, and each time something fails, it's an opportunity to try something different. Uh, I'm continuing to find issues in the process and new pain points that need to be addressed. Uh, for, for example, I current, I'm currently struggling to ensure the testing process is not as much of a burden on the game teams. Um, and that is part due to not having totally fixed the out of sync with milestone problem. Um, the research is not fully part of production plans um, and is done in addition to what is planned for milestones and sprints. Um, so I am still reassessing and looking for ways to improve uh, and evolve the way we do research. Um, we're also experimenting um, with new workflows, uh, especially with remote testing, testing for multiplayer games, trying out biometrics. Um, not everything ends up working out well, uh, but it's still worth uh, experimenting with. Um, I've also realized for, that each project and each team has different needs. Um, the process can be uh, taken as is to a team uh, and implemented the same way for every game. Uh, looking at how the team works, what do they need, what kind of project it is, what tools they are using, what data would be useful and how best to share it. Um, all of that means that research gets adapted to fit, to fit each project, um, not always in big ways. Uh, the main components are always there, but in practical ways, there is always something different in how we organize research. So what's the catch? Uh, why am I presenting this step-by-step -step process while at the same time telling you it shouldn't be set in stone? Uh, I think this is a good way to show that it's all right to fail, it's okay to get it wrong, uh, to experiment and to learn and reassess as you go along. Uh, there are a lot of ways of gathering feedback from the people you work with, what their pain points are, uh, what needs to change, and be open-minded to the incoming feedback. Um, I don't believe our processes uh, should be fully set in stone uh, and, take, uh, and take that specific thing from one project to the next. Um, I think it's useful to consider what is actually not working at all, what can be tossed and redone, uh, and what can be improved and changed. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much for listening, uh, and feel free to get in touch with me uh, if you have any questions or feedback. Thank you.
We hope you enjoyed Crux Online. Thank you to our wonderful speakers, our generous event sponsors, our amazing ASL interpreter Deb Taylor, our volunteer event team, and of course, you, our viewers. Videos of the sessions will be available soon on the Groxig YouTube channel, and we can keep the conversation going in our Discord. The next event from our volunteer community is the Games UR Summit in the first half of 2022. For news on that event and more great content, follow at Games UR on Twitter. And for Grox Online attendees, we have an exciting giveaway from Sketch and an extended trial offer from Balsamic. All you have to do is subscribe to our newsletter at the link below. From all the Grox Online team, thank you very much, and we hope to see you again next year.